Retro Raw number 237, December 8th, 1997. A horrible show. Let's not <laughs> mince words. They recap the results of the DX pay-per-view, including Austin driving a truck down to the ring so D'Lo Brown could take bumps on it. He went on to pin The Rock to regain the Intercontinental title, although technically... He I never guess, had it. Yeah. He, he retained the title. He just got back the physical belt. This was such a Vince Russo show. Yes. Yep. And you know what? It was fucking just horrible. Awful. Yeah. With the exception of everything involving Vince McMahon, Steve Austin, and I can't even say DX. I think The Rock. Think the Rock well, The Rock was intertwined. Yeah. But everything else on this show was so bad. So Vince came out for a promo, his first appearance in front of a TV crowd since Montreal. He was getting a mixed reaction, and the announcers acknowledged this. Said Vin, uh, Vince said he could not deny the popularity of Stone Cold Steve Austin, but Austin could not keep attacking officials and announcers. And last night, Austin had gone too far. He had endangered the lives of fans by driving his truck down to the ring. Well, you know, it could have gone out of control. That's possible. He's being drowned out by a chance of Austin's name. He very politely asked for the fans' attention. That was awesome. Mm -hmm. More people need to do that. He demanded Austin give Rock a title rematch tonight. I believe it was the first time he, uh, Rock was called the People's Champ. Austin came out, ran his mouth. Vince said, I am the owner of this company and your boss. Austin was not impressed. Vince told him to watch his language, coincidentally. And Austin replied exactly like Brian did, by cursing more. He said he was going to go backstage and think about things, and if he came back out, somebody was getting their ass whipped, whether it was a wrestler, official, or Vince himself. The announcers for this first hour were Jim Ross, Michael Cole, and Kevin Kelly. What a crew. Three play-by-play -play dudes. Michael Cole has not changed his announcing style in 19 years. <laughs> He's exactly the same. Yeah. His voice hasn't changed at all. Like, get better. Like Kevin he Kelly. He says the exact same things yeah. that he says. But Kevin Kelly was good. Right. Michael Cole was not good. But he's gotten even better. And he's still not good. Jerry Lawler defeated Sonny in the Karate Fighters, karate fighters Tournament Finals. Even this was overbooked. Dude, this was the overbooked was. classic is what it was. There was, was hidden camera footage. <laughs> he was caught cheating on camera in a variety of ways. At which point, we were informed... The Karate Fighters Tribunal had stepped in. I'm not making this up. And awarded the tournament to Sonny. Next time you talk to Dave on a retro show, I want more info on the Karate Fighters Tribunal. Mm -hmm. Who was on this panel? Well, Which clearly three, three people. What did they do to deserve it? Is it a... I'll bet you anything it is the Overweight Classic Championship Committee. I can't prove it's not. Yeah, at one point, Jerry actually took gum out of his mouth, stuck it on the platform, and placed his fighter on the platform so it would stick, so it wouldn't fall off. They recapped the Godwins interfering at the pay-per-view to cost the LOD a tag team title match. Officially, the Warriors were the winners. Or excuse me, they were disqualified for hitting Road Dog with a bucket. This led to Godwins versus Legion of Doom. With Stop right there. The fucking Godwins against the Legion of Doom. How many times have we seen this horrible match? Are they trying to win the ratings war, or what's happening on this show? I don't think so. I watched this show, and Steve Austin even... They do an inside shoot comment about Steve Austin saying, I know you need me out here for your precious ratings or whatever. Obviously, they're very aware that they're being killed in the ratings war. But I watched this show, and they can't really be trying. The Legion of Doom and the Godwins for the 5,000th time. The fucking DOA against the Bariquas for the 9,000th time. Jeff Jarrett not wrestling for the 5,000th time. That's Who a plus. could possibly want to watch this show going head-to-head? -head? And Nitro wasn't even a good show. But it was way better than this. There was a combined about 15 minutes of wrestling on this yeah, and program. look at the 15 minutes they gave us. Yeah, it should have been seven minutes. So this went like two minutes. The lights went out. Kane appeared. Animal had just been thrown into the stairs. So he was taking out, and it was Kane and Hawk alone. And I was trying to figure out what the hell did they... How did they talk Hawk into being a victim of Kane? And the answer was they let him know sell a pile driver first. 
Kane hit a standard sit-down pile driver. Hawk no-sold it. He turned around and got choke slammed anyway. It was the worst choke slam ever. Yep. It's so stupid. I know Hawk has a gimmick of standing up after pile drivers, mm-hmm. but in his whole lifetime, Kane executed one pile driver. All is set up so that this guy could stand up. Yeah, and then get choke slammed anyway. And this choke slam. <laughs> let me explain this choke slam to everybody. He lifted him straight up in the air, and then Hawk just fell straight back down on his ass. He didn't land on his back. He didn't really even land on his tailbone. I don't think he jumped. Yeah, he I, just went straight up and straight back down I, on his ass. I think saying he went up in the air is giving him too much credit. Oh, he went up. He went on tiptoes, but... But he went right back down, ass first on the cement. Or the mat. Or the mat. May as well have been cement. There's no way to take that bump without it hurting. JR was incensed, and he called Kane, and I quote, the one-eyed monster. And they tried that for a while. Mm-hmm. It, it didn't, didn't work. It didn't stick. Thank God. The big red one-eyed monster. Anyway, uh, Kane left, and the outlaws saw Hawk was helpless. They attacked him. The outlaws were wearing South Park t-shirts. Now, I realized South Park was a huge thing in 1998. I was a huge fan of 1998. But can you imagine a tag team on Raw attacking someone wearing Game of Thrones shirts or Breaking Bad or Sons of Anarchy or whatever the hot new show is? No, it wouldn't happen. It was very strange. They go to break. They come back. Billy and Road Dogg are still out there. Roadie's cutting a promo about how they have no competition, so they sing a song instead. It was the goodbye song dedicated to the Road Warriors. They dared anyone to come fight Billy Gunn. Is there anybody who can sing the goodbye song well? Road Dogg's gimmick was that he was secretly a great singer. Yes. He still fucked it up. Yes. Has anyone ever done a good job singing that song? Who did it originally? I have no idea. This might have been it. I need to look that up. Sinatra Kiss couldn't have goodbye. sung the song, Craig, apparently. get to work. Anyway, Do Love came out to accept Billy Gunn's challenge to a singles match. To which Road Dogg protests, protests saying, this is three men, not one. We had Dude Love versus Billy Gunn with Road Dogg on commentary. He was funny. He noted that Dude owed him money for trans. I laughed. Referred to the Godwins as Southern Justice. I don't know if that gimmick is now or coming down the road or what. Had a fun little TV match. Dude hit Shin Music and the Double Arm DDT for the win. Way to go, Billy. And Road Dog got in the ring, and he hit Dude Love with a very violent chair shot to the head. These next few years of shows are not going to be fun. You watch Raw lately? They're not fun now. No, that's true. Because of chair shots like this. Oh. They put the tag belts over Dude's face, and Billy went for a top rope leg drop. But he came up way, way, way short and nearly broke his leg and nearly drove his knee into Dude's head. It was a fun match with a post-match angle that went south in a hurry. Rock did a promo backstage. Audio here was terrible. There was static. There was echoes. It was all awful. But it didn't matter because Rock is so great, he made this a fun segment anyway. They recapped Takamichi Noku defeating Brian Christopher in the tournament finals of the pay-per-view to become the first light heavyweight champion. Christopher then cut an irate promo in the hallways afterwards, vowing he would have the last laugh. Jim Cornette brought Taka down to the ring for a promo. Taka Michinoku, the new champion, and the first thing they do with the guy is a backstage segment, a comedy segment. Uh, finger, he's, finger quotes, comedy. He's a child mm-hmm. who can not yet speak the language. No. And so Jim Ross, the friendly grandfather, is teaching him his first words. Slobber knocker. Yeah. And Taka has to attempt to say slobber knocker repeatedly. So back in the ring, Cornet is about to introduce Taka's first challenger when Jerry Lawler interrupts. Calls Taka a fraud and an evil foreigner. He demands Taka speak English, pokes his finger in Taka's chest, and Taka pokes back and says, You jackass! I should have said, You slobber knocker. That would have at least played off that previous angle. He knows one word. Do you want to tell him or No, you I? go ahead. Cornet stops Lawler from retaliating. What? Nothing. <laughs> he brings out Taka's challenger, El Unico. Why can't he call him a slobber knocker? Well. 
A masked man comes out. Have you watched this show? <laughs> yes, I have, Brian. You should have called him a slobber knocker. <laughs> See how that goes one of these times. Call you one of your buddies a slobber knocker. Craig. Yeah. You're a fucking slobber knocker. Take that back or I'll come over this table and beat you. <laughs> you couldn't even make it over this table. Give me a break. Are we good? Where were we? <laughs> Doesn't matter. El Unico comes out. Oh, yeah. I cannot believe that this show stalled to a halt <laughs> because Craig Proper thought that yeah. on this show, right. this edition of Raw, with Goldust flashing a man, DX doing strip poker, Sable with electrical tape over tits, it is unacceptable for Taka uh -huh. to call this man a slobber knocker when that was the one word that he was taught backstage by Jim Ross. The term slobber knocker... If you were to call one of your buddies that, would we, would make them seem like, hey, you have slobbered on knockers. Yeah. Okay. My point is, on this show, mm -hmm. have you watched Raw yet? Yeah. I would have told Enzo to take his pants off. Right. Right here on national television. But and he, he did. But she didn't tell him to slobber on her knockers. Maybe. Probably didn't have to. He was. Yeah. Hmm. The whole time. So this masked man was... Uh, did anyone not know who this masked man was? The announcers. But not even the announcers. He took his mask off and the crowd gasped. That's true. <laughs> <Yeah>. You <laughs> morons didn't know that this was Brian Christopher. In a mask, yes. So, yes, they ambushed Taka, hit a bunch of pile drivers on him, and that was that. They recapped the destruction of the Hart Foundation. How long are they going to drag this out? It's been 20 years. Well, you see, That's they're true. trying to win a ratings <laughs> war. And Vince thinks he stumbled on something, which he did, by the way. It just wasn't this. And I know when you guys go to your uh, network every week and you pull down the 1997 year and the last thing on Nitro is Bret Hart. It's Bret Hart. Every time, yeah. Crazy. It is. This is a weird year. A big, 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 weird, weird, weird year. Anyway, so Sean beat the Bulldog in England. He defeated Brett in Montreal, which in this video package was treated as a totally legit victory, to the point where they edited in Sean celebrating with the belt of the DX pay-per-view like that happened in Montreal. And they showed the Jim Neidhart stuff in the past two weeks, and finally Owen attacking Sean at the end of the pay-per-view. They said this was Owen's last act of revenge, and now the book on the Hart Foundation was closed. Flash Funk versus The Interrogator. Oh, my God. <laughs> I wrote... Let me count him here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 10, 11, 12. I wrote 14 words about this segment. Four of them were fucking horrible and fucking hideous. All of, all of those work. What, what were the other 10? I must know. Just as bad as Braun Strowman. Claw and claw slam finish. I admit I have not seen as much Braun Strowman as you, but I'm pretty sure Kurgan was worse. Well... This was actually, there was a very brief period of time where Kurgan was a little bit better than Braun Strowman, but Braun Strowman has improved to the point that they're now equally terrible. I see. Do not believe the people on the board, Vinny. H high praise. That try to claim that Braun Strowman is actually really good. I believe nothing I read on the board. It's bullshit. Yeah. He's horrible. So Kurgan won here with a terrible Iron Claw slam. He refused to release the whole jackal, by the way. They've ditched the Truth Commission gimmick. They're no longer South African military people. It's jackal as a cult leader and a bunch of psychos who follow him. This is much better. Yeah, but I love how there's no transition. It just happened. <laughs> They're just now a different gimmick. I don't Why care. Why the hell not? I don't care. It's so much better. The, the, the explanation is this is better. Yeah, well, this was way better. Well... <laughs> this Flash Funk Kurgan match. So Jackal does not stop Kurgan from releasing the hold. He just stands over uh, Kurgan, and who's still doing this claw after the match. He gets DQ'd for refusing to break the hold. Sniper and Recon, who are still in camo, they hit the ring. Jackal turns his back on them. They attack Kurgan. He just shrugs them off. And eventually Jackal slaps Kurgan in the face. They cackle together, and Jackal pulls him away, and they leave. Did we ever get any kind of explanation to why the jackal wore a jewel in the middle of his forehead? He's a cult leader. Because that's something a cult leader would do. I see. He gives his followers something to focus on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's All the I, third eye. Yeah. All I know is, 
And this is going to sound like I'm sucking up because this guy is now doing a show with a friend of ours, but right. Jackal is so much better than I remembered. Yeah. Yes. He was out there with these stiffs. <laughs> he had nothing to work with, but he was still very, very good. He's gone at great lengths on his podcast to discuss this gimmick that he was saddled with. <laughs> it's good stuff. He's been holding it in for 20 years now and finally gets a chance to vent. They recap DX getting intentionally disqualified to save Sean's title at the pay-per-view the night before. By the way, throughout this whole show, they showed clips, still shots of the pay-per-view, and it actually helped tell the story of what was going on on Raw the next night. It was really good. You know what's funny is this Ken Shamrock promo here. He's vowing to go through 29 other men in the Royal Rumble. He's going to get to Sean. He's going to win the title. He says, Sean, I'm coming to get you. And this is Ken Shamrock, who at the time was the world's most dangerous man. He was a UFC fighter, and he came here to WWE, and he was legit. And he did this promo, and it was just wacky. And then, on Nitro, Ravishing Rick Rude comes out near the end of the show. The lights have gone out repeatedly. And Eric Bischoff comes out with Rick Rude, and Rick Rude is wearing a suit. And Rick Rude cuts this promo on the announcers. Where he basically says, if these fucking lights go out again, I am going to kill all three of you. And they believed him. I believed him. I was like, I ain't shutting the lights off tonight. This fucking guy's going to show up and kick my ass. I was so scared. <laughs> he was so intimidating. And I was like, look what they've done to Ken Shamrock. <laughs> he cuts a mean promo and I'm laughing. Rick Rude cuts a mean promo. I don't want to shut the lights off. Yeah. You were not wrong. Rude was a bad motherfucker, though. That he is wasn't true. an MMA fighter, but he was a bad dude, and boy, was he able to project that he was a bad dude. He could carry himself like a badass much better than Ken Shamrock could have this point. Oh, my God. Shamrock was a cartoon. Yeah. That is... You know what? You're exactly right. That is, that is the big difference. DX came out for a promo. Here we go. There was a card table set up in the ring. Shawn Michaels is openly drinking from, bo from a bottle of whiskey. You know what? This DX... The original. They were around for five months. Mm -hmm. That's it. Then Sean retired for a few years. Right. And as a kid, I guess not a kid, I was 22 or whatever, but... You're still a kid. It seemed like they were around forever. Mm -hmm. Now I know why. This goddamn segment <laughs> was 30 minutes long. I'm not even joking. Yeah. They were out there for 30 minutes while a match is going on in the ring well they did a segment and then a match and then another segment right and they were on camera the whole time so hunter rundown starts to slaughter for a while says i'm too much man for you and your wife sean brags about his win and i know i know i've said this before i know he does it every week but sean cutting this entire like five minute promo just openly staring at himself on the titan tron not even facing the hard camera his mm -hmm. body's turned towards the tron it never fails to amuse me. I got to ask everybody on the board. Has Sean ever addressed the Titan Tron? I don't know. Has he ever done an interview where somebody has asked him, why were you always looking at the Titan Tron? Because there's part of me that thinks this man was so in love with himself that he could not help but look at himself the whole time in the Titan Tron. But then there's the other part of me that thinks, what an awesome heel. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't like you didn't notice. No. I mean, they didn't call attention to it. But it was impossible to miss that he could not help but stare at himself in the Titan Tron the whole time he talked. Like, maybe this was by design. I wouldn't put money on it, but I swear when he came back after his injury, he didn't do this. Or at I least think I didn't was, notice. He was a very changed man. Exactly. He was. I, hey, I don't know. So you mentioned Owen Hart raining on their parade the night before. He said DX had destroyed the Hart family once and for all, which drew a mixed reaction. He made the famous analogy about flushing the Hart family out of the company, but Owen was the nugget that could not be flushed. And it was gross and crude, but hey, they're degenerates. <laughs> Just doing what the gimmick says. This, by the way, even at house shows, Owen got heat from the crowd when the crowd chanting, Nugget, yeah, Nugget. Of course. And then he would say, he'd cut a promo saying, I am not a nugget. And this, of course, would make them chant more. Yeah. yeah. Rest thing is easy sometimes. It is. So, uh, let's see. He said he would not leave the ring until somebody brought Owen out to take an ass kicking. 
And until then, DX is going to play a game of poker. China whispers in Sean's ear. Sean reminds everyone, a few weeks back, he had promised to walk naked down to the ring and not delivered on that promise. So tonight, they were going to play a strip poker until Owen appeared. Then he had more whiskey. I think originally he was going to have a dog called Naked. Mm. That was the gimmick. <laughs> that would have been much funnier. And maybe they just forgot. Yeah. Maybe they couldn't find a dog. The DOA came out. Sean lost a hand of poker, removed his shirt, and went to break. When they came back, it was Los Bariquas versus DOA. The Three words I wrote about this match. <laughs> Anybody want to guess? Fuck this shit. Fucking goddamn hideous. There you go. Hmm. This was so bad. That may be more than I wrote about the actual match. What in the world were they thinking putting this on national television? Is Miguel Perez the doppel the the Latino doppelganger to Tommy Dreamer? I actually have noticed that. They have the same haircut and same yeah. beard. Yeah. Huh. So anyway, DX is on the floor. Sean had lost his shirt, one sock, and one shoe. So no one cared about the match, and nothing was happening in the poker game. These people were doing, like, one hand of poker every ten minutes or so. You know what I love about Sean? He's got a bottle that he's going to break over Mosh's head. Right. It's made of glass. Sure. Why'd he take his shoes and socks off playing this fucking game? Hunter was smart enough not to take his shoes off. China's smart enough not to take her shoes off. This idiot's walking around in broken glass. Are you saying Shawn Michaels is a bad decision maker? He may have made a poor decision to take his shoes and socks off in this segment. Now, at this point, I wrote something that I must admit is untrue. I wrote that the match broke down. This match never had a... It, it was broken down before it started. So the Bricos won after a 2 by 4 shot. And as they're leaving the ring, they are trying to get in on DX's heat and get in on camera and like give him a thumbs up and DX... Couldn't see them. <laughs> they were invisible to DX. <laughs> Paid them no attention. We have our third DX segment in a row. We are now playing poker back of the ring. Hunter is shirtless. Lawler is very upset that China keeps winning. So Sean loses a hand again. And what followed was subtle. But I'm pretty sure it was the best moment of China's career. For all year, she's just... What was subtle about this? For all year, she's just been a monolith. Stoic. She never shows any expression of any kind. Here, she raises her poker hand high in the air. She slams it down on the table and she has won. Sean is pissed. Now Sean must remove his trousers. And as Sean stands, China gives him a huge smile and shoots him the finger guns over and over again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this was not subtle. This was the least subtle thing she'd done since she debuted. <laughs> she clasped her hands together. She was them. full of such On joy. Either side, yeah. maybe, okay, subtle is the wrong word. The point is it was awesome. She shakes her hands on the other side of her head in celebration. You know what she was? She was Bridget if you had to strip. Kind of. That's actually very... That is exactly what this was. <laughs> yes. I need to throw up in a potted plant. <laughs> How dare you? So... Sean begins to undo his belt, and she squeezes her hands between her knees and giggles like a shy schoolgirl. Finally, he's like, he takes his pants off, and she's leaning way back to see get a glimpse of his ass. Her character was, she was an emotionless, stone-faced assassin who had a schoolgirl crush on the Heartbreak Kid. That's so awesome! Headbangers came out to ruin everything. As is their <laughs> want. This was the best thing the headbangers ever did. Yeah. <laughs> they walked down to the ring. They got into the ring. They were right up to DX. And they were like, get the hell out of here. We got a match. They flipped the car table over. And they took a severe, solid thrashing. No Sh pun intended. Sean, oh, yeah. Sean takes his Jack Daniels bottle, mm -hmm. which he's yeah. drank out of. Mm -hmm. It's legit. Mm. And he fucking smashes it over Mosh's head. Mosh's head is all busted open. He's got gashes everywhere. And I was just like, between the chair shot and this broken glass bottle on a dude's head, we've had Jack Daniels bottles here. These things are solid. Yeah. What the fuck were they doing I'm here? I'm sure it was a gimmick bottle. I don't think so, dude. He had gashes all over the top of I his understand. head. I understand. I know it really cut him. This was so... Stupid. Then they powerbomb the other guy through the card table. 
That was also stupid. Which had like a metal frame and legs everywhere. Yeah. yeah. Don't bend. Maybe if you would have given Hawk that choke slam, <laughs> he would have went right through that table perfectly. I guess. The way he went ass first. This guy nearly killed himself. So they're torturing the headbangers for a while with chairs in the neck and running them down. I'm the heartbreak kid, kid. And all I could think was, did the headbangers do something to really piss DX off? For a moment, I felt sorry for the headbangers. No, they were the headbangers. They're just stupid idiots out there to take a beating. Well, this was the way it was scripted. Hmm. If it would have been DOA, they would have taken the same beating. I highly doubt that. <laughs> Ken Shamrock would have taken the same beating. Anyway. Well, not Ken. <laughs> Shawn Michaels is not hitting Ken <laughs> Shamrock with a glass Jack Daniels bottle. That's kind of my point. So Sean's standing on a headbanger in his underwear and patting his balls when Owen suddenly appears, tackles Sean, and throws a flurry of punches and runs away. <laughs> we waited 30 minutes for that. Yeah. That was the payoff. Jeff Jarrett versus Vader. Oh, my <laughs> God. Jeff got a new song. Somebody thought this was a great idea. Dude, yeah. someone thought this whole show was a great oh, idea. That's true, that's true. So there's music playing, and it's like synthesizers and it's soft and you hear Jeff's voice he says there's all the great WWF superstars and then there's me the one the only the world's greatest wrestler Jeff Jarrett was that supposed to be funny even once well obviously somebody thought this was a great idea talk about X-Pac heat talk about Jarrett heat <laughs> Touche. Vader comes out. Goldust flashes Vader. Vader chases Goldust to the back. Jared is happy to win by countout. And here I wrote, Billy Gunn has been in the best match of the show so far. Right. They recapped Mark Merrow fighting Butterbean at the pay-per-view. Now, this is only shown through still shots, so I'm, I may be mistaken, but it appeared that Mark Merrow used a drop kick in this boxing match, and the fight just continued. Well, I don't know if it just continued. That may have been the finish. I don't remember. Much I can't tell. It's your classic boxing match, pro wrestling deal. The guy body slams. You get him a low blow and a kick him. Or hits some him with bullshit. a stool for the DQ. It made Butterbean mad. I know that. Bean vowed revenge, threatened to stark stalk Marrow into a dark alley or a meat locker. If this guy called you on the phone, and you didn't know it was Butterbean, I would not be scared. No. A very high voice. He reminds me of Curly from the Three Stooges. Very <laughs> That's much. fair. Salvatore Sincere versus Mark Merrill. Jesus. This they, was so stupid. They didn't know what to call him. They called him Brady at one point. If there was ever a Vince Russo segment, it was this one. Yeah. Merrill comes out and he cuts a promo and he says, Sal Sincere, you're a jobber. That's what they call a guy who always loses. You're a jabroni. And in fact, you're not even Sal Sincere. You're Tom Brandy doing a stupid gimmick. And then Jim Ross makes fun of Mark Merrow for his old stupid gimmick. Yeah. So As then he should. Calls out Sable, who is in a potato sack. He asks her to disrobe him. Everybody can see this coming. She takes off the potato sack. She's virtually nude. Mark Merrow's very mad. Sal drop kicks him outside. It's a good payoff. Wins via count out. Sable. It was a good payoff. It was. But my God, <laughs> it's just it's, this show. What has happened to this show? All I can say is that for Brock Lesnar's sake, I hope Sable still has this bikini. Rock versus Steve Austin. Yeah. What a match. Vince McMahon has returned to ringside to ensure that Austin will show up to wrestle. There literally has not been a match since Barik was in DOA about 40 minutes earlier. A fan held up a sign reading, quote, Stop the perversion and blaspheme. Not blasphemy. Blaspheme, a verb. Stop being perverted and do something that takes the Lord's name in vain. Blasphemous, yes. Yes. Did you see the sign that said, I want to invade China? I saw that one too, yeah. Yeah. Austin came out in street clothes, which did not make Rock or Vince happy. Austin announced he was not going to wrestle. He had already whipped Rock's ass the night before. He dared Vince to fire him. Before Vince can do anything, Rock leans over, grabs the, Mac and grabs the mic, and says, Vince, The Rock thinks you should fire him. I love The Rock. I know, breaking news in 2016, The Rock is great. Hey, let me put over The Rock. 
The Rock was such a great heel that when Stone Cold Steve Austin came out and said, I refuse to wrestle tonight. I already beat this man the night before. I don't feel like wrestling here. He was still cheered. Yes. Because some people hated The Rock so much. This was the most cowardly act. But everybody still loved him because they hated The Rock so much. Yeah. And at least he did try to make sense of this. So Rock says that The Rock thinks Vince should fire him. Vince says, stay out of this. He threatens to strip the title from Austin and award it to The Rock. Austin explains, I have been IC champ. I have been tag team champion. The world championship is all I have left on my plate. I shall forfeit this title to The Rock because I don't want it anymore. He hands the belt over, orders The Rock to shake his hand, saying, trust me. So, of course, Rock shakes his hand and he's all happy. And, of course, Austin stuns him and tells him don't trust anybody. He grabs the belt and tells Vince, if you want ratings, send a camera crew to follow me next week. I have plans for this belt. And then amid all the chaos going on afterwards. So Steve Austin knew what town they were going to be in next week. And he concocted a plan involving a bridge in that town. Mm -hmm. This must have been a landlocked town with no water nearby. Could not possibly do it here this evening. He begins to run the ropes. He accidentally knocks Vince off the apron to the floor. Vince that, took the best bump. Yeah. And he looks back in anger, and Austin tries to explain, I was just running the ropes. It was an accident. That was at least funny. At least the show had a good finish. Everything that Vince and Austin did... Are you ready for quite the statement here? I'm, re I'm ready to write down your words. Everything they did was awesome. Wow. Yeah, write that down. Vince... In hindsight, Austin the were. Vince Austin feud was awesome. phenomenal. Vinny, put that in caps. Do you know why it was oh, great? Bold. Because Steve Austin really understood how to be a badass who was also a babyface, but he was still a badass. He didn't have to pander. No. He... There was a point... He was so good at his character. In one of these promos, the fans started chanting his name. He told him to shut up. <laughs> and Vince is the best foil ever. There's never been a better foil for anybody, I don't think, than Vince McMahon for Steve Austin. Steve Austin says the most offensive things, and Vince McMahon is so offended. Yes. Mm -hmm. And Steve Austin does... I mean... Who else in the whole world could you do the spot where the guy hits the ropes and sends the other guy flying, and it's as fucking amazing as this was? Vince took a bump. Literally, you mentioned Fatty Arbuckle. Or who'd you mention? Curly? Yeah. Of the Three Stooges? I was thinking of Fatty Arbuckle. It'd be another good one, but... Vince took a pratfall from the 1920s. He flies in the air. His hands go up in the air. His pompadour goes flying. Just fucking great. And he's in a suit. Yeah. Just amazing. Everything they did was so great. And it has just begun. We have years left to enjoy. Stephanie McMahon came from this man. I know. it's a st And he writes her stuff. Right. <laughs> I just don't get it. Well, I mean, she... What, she know. can't look like a clown? No, she can't. That's the problem. She can't. Anyway, yeah. Nitro. I'll give you a good example. All right. They wanted to do some sort of goofy angle where Stephanie would get arrested. And it was overruled because they didn't want fake Stephanie mugshots on the internet. Oh, my gosh. Because her children would find them. That was when Vince did the deal where he got arrested. And remember he did the real wacky mugshot where he just looked like his eyes were wide and he just looked horrible and furious? Vince has no problem being made to look like a total ass. That's true. But he does not want his daughter to look like a total ass, or his son-in-law, or anybody except himself and his idiot announcers. And wrestlers. I have found the Vince McMahon mugshot. Yeah! <laughs> forgot. That was supposed to be Stephanie. <laughs> Forgotten how great that is. <laughs> but they overruled it, and then Vince did it. Isn't that amazing? Oh, never not be funny. How did I forget this? What's wrong I with me? I have no idea. What the fuck is wrong with you? Oh, my God. Retro Raw number 238, December 15th, 1997. Before we begin, I do want to say uh, it's a very busy time of year, and thus my schedule, which I can barely keep on top of anyway, I'm going to have even less time. So I've, I'm actually already halfway through next week's Retro Raw. So if I get confused, that's why. Here we go. 
Undertaker came out for a promo. Jim Ross said he may be the greatest WWF superstar of all time. It's a reasonable statement in 2016. It was a line of bullshit in 1997. So Cole's interviewing Taker. Taker announces, or Cole announces, that Taker will face Shawn Michaels for the world title at Royal Rumble in a casket match. Damn it. A stip that cost us a half a decade of Shawn Michaels matches. Taker said he had lost one casket match in his career. It took 10 men to stuff him into that casket, and DX didn't have 10 dudes. Lights go out. Kane's pyro goes off. Kane and Paul Bearer come out to confront him. Paul Bearer says, It's a family reunion. The only thing missing is your parents, because you, Undertaker, killed them in a fire. This made Taker sad. Paul says, Everyone Kane has been beating up lately is all Undertaker's fault. They will continue until Taker faces Kane in a match. And Kane slaps Taker in the face. He tries a second one. Taker blocks it, but shakes his head and walks away. Undertaker was a horrible promo back then. He was horrible. And then, on this Monday Night Raw, where we've had a transvestite, gold dust, or whatever the hell he's supposed to be, and we've had rampant swearing, the Undertaker cannot say the word ass. <laughs> Literally, he was about to say the word ass, mm -hmm. and then he stopped, and he looked around, and he wouldn't say it. And then, later on in the show, they wouldn't call him Badass Billy Gunn. They called him B.A. Billy Gunn. B.A. Billy Gunn, which I believe also made its way on several toy packages back in the day. Had an ad for the theme music CD that included Vader playing drums, Mankind playing piano, Taker playing cymbals, and Steve Austin destroying a guitar. Undertaker playing the cymbals? Yeah. Why would the Undertaker be playing the cymbals? Well, it's that or the gong. Shouldn't it be like, yeah, a gong? Or a xylophone? Something. You ever seen those xylophones made of bones? That's what the Undertaker should have been playing. That's even more preposterous than the Undertaker playing cymbals. No, it's not. He's the Undertaker. Do you want to ruin his career forever <laughs> here in 1997? Dude, he's playing the cymbals. It was already ruined. It was ruined by that promo right there. Jerry Lawler versus Taki Michinoku. In hindsight, probably not even in hindsight, probably it was always obvious at the time, how big a mistake did Taki Michinoku make signing with WWF instead of WCW? Mm -hmm. Hey, they, they built this around him, dude. Oh, yeah. He's in with Jerry Lawler. Dude, Taki Michinoku against Jerry Lawler is very wacky, mm -hmm. but have you ever watched Nitro? <sighs> it could have been Taki Michinoku versus... Steve Mongo McMichael. Could have been Taka Michinoku versus Ming. Possible, but more likely Taka versus Ray or Ultimo Dragon. Well, you would have had that here and there. But they had other wacky matches as well. And you know what? For a Jerry Lawler Taka Michinoku match, as wacky as this was, and it was very wacky, when Vince McMahon did his promo later and talked about the wacky world of the WWF, he's talking about this match Taka Michinoku against Jerry Lawler. It was fine. They blew some spots, but it was a very, very much a styles clash. It was fine. It wasn't like it was a bad match, but this could have been any other small guy on the roster in there selling Lawler's chokes and punches. This could have been Scott Taylor. Wouldn't have been any different. It's Jerry it Lawler, Eric Shelley, or whoever was in that tournament. Eric Shelley. They had a guy named Shelley in the tournament. Jerry Lawler Point just me. turned forty-eight years old in this match. Yes. He never went to the gym. He never watched what he ate. He was doing great out there. He ran. Yeah. He took bumps. Sure. He Did looked he, funny. Do a drop kick. The fact, in fact, I would actually say he looks too good because he's out there not sweating, not breathing hard, just dominating Taka Michinoku. Did Taka no favors. I also liked when they plugged the upcoming Ultimate Fighting Championship event from Japan, including such fighters as, as Jim Ross called him, Vitter Belfort. <laughs> Close enough. So Lawler missed the fist drop and Taka hit a Mitch Noku driver and Brian Christopher attacked for the DQ. And this went on a ways and uh, eventually Taka ducked a punch and Christopher hit Lawler and Taka was proud to have outsmarted them. This was a waste. How many times do you think Jerry Lawler's been dove onto from the top rope? This may have been the only time. I'm sure PG-13 jumped on him a time or two. Yeah, maybe. He did scream in terror as Taka Mitch Noku was flying at him. That was pretty awesome. 
LOD did a promo backstage comparing DX to assorted annoying celebrities. Rock and the Nation come out for a promo. I knew that you would skip Jim Ross's hotline plug. His 1-900 hotline plug. Talking about DX almost causing a riot. He wanted us to call and get the inside scoop. What's the scoop, Brian? Well, the scoop was they fucking caused a riot. Sean decided that he was going to go out there for the main event and some fans started throwing some stuff. Actually, it was Sean's fault because Sean had made some sort of comment like, I hear you fans in Memphis or whatever have bad aim. Ooh. Yeah. So they all pelted him with garbage. And then he said, you just lost your main event. It's like and that he, time Nickelback was on stage and people were throwing quarters at them. And Chad Kroger gets up the mic and says, if I feel one more quarter hit and then boom, they walked off stage. Yeah, it's exactly like that. Yeah. Except what happened was, Sean said, you just lost your main event and left. And a legitimate riot broke out. And the police were called. Some dude went to the hospital. Point of all of this is, let's just say that you're WWF and Shawn Michaels causes two riots in one weekend, which he did. He did two nights in a row like this. They were supposed to be... In fact, one of them, he wasn't even in the main event. It was supposed to be Triple H. And Sean was just out there because Sean only had to wrestle once a week. And Sean comes out and he causes a riot and they cancel that match as well. So you have a guy that has walked out of two main events because of fans throwing stuff at the ring. Why would you, on the WWF hotline, tell this story and essentially encourage fans to throw stuff mm -hmm. at Shawn Michaels? Yeah. Because as we saw on the other show, when you have fake fans <laughs> run into the ring on Nitro and throw garbage, the next thing you know, you have garbage thrown in the ring and real fans hitting the ring multiple times per show. So Rock of the Nation come out for a promo. Rock is out there in t-shirt and jeans and the biggest fanny pack you ever saw. Yokozuna's fanny would not have been big enough for this pack. Farouk tried to say something, but Rock cut him off and said, the champ is talking. Farouk was taken aback by this. Taken aback. He spent the whole, not only rest of the promo, but when they came out again, staring a hole in the rock. How dare dare this young man. This guy's taking my spot. He's trying he to take over the nation. He is. Rock ran down Steve Austin for stealing the People's Intercontinental title. Demanded Austin return it right now. Austin's music hit. The all turned to the stage, except Farouk, who was still gobsmacked. Rock would not let him speak. Austin runs down Rock the Nation and says, find a monitor, see where the belt goes, and I'm warning you, Rock, you're in over your head. He left. Rock keeps on talking. Gives Austin one hour to return the belt, or he and the nation would search the building and give him a public beating. And a Ken Shamrock hype video about how he never knew his father and he had grown up fighting to survive. Which is true. Dude Love versus Road Dog. Since Road Dog was wrestling, that meant Billy Gunn did the promo coming down the ramp. That it was good. Never happened again for a reason. It quite sucked. Michael Cole, he joined the commentary desk. Michael Cole called him B.A. Billy Gunn. B.A. Billy Gunn. Thank God, finally, after all this time, Ross finally called them the New Age Outlaws. So we can just call them that now instead of having to say Road Dog and Billy Gunn. He, uh, let's see. Billy Gunn interfered for the heat. Road Dog did a worm. Mid-match, dude snapped and turned into Mankind, hitting the mandible claw, yanking out his own hair. Uh, he's doing all the corner punches and the running knee in the corner, sitting against the ropes and rocking. And then suddenly he's just back into Dude Love and he hits Shin Music and the double arm DDT for the win. And Billy went to hit Dude with a chair and Dude said, uh-uh, not after last week, no way. And he cuts him off and they all brawl up the ramp. There's a double suplex on the stage and eventually they throw the ref in a Dude. Dude goes flying off the stage, kind of, sort of, through a table, more onto and over it. Hit very hard onto the ground. The outlaws feigned concern and then put the boots to him until everyone left him away, or let, uh, led them away. And finally, dude was helped to his feet, and the crowd is chanting his name, and dude is looking at them like, fuck you, I'm in pain. Well, like, it's a fan's fault that he jumped off the goddamn side of the ramp through mm. a table? I don't know what to tell you. Well, it didn't do him any favors when he didn't hit the table in the middle, 
And then you could see after the table got turned over that the one leg had actually broken off, causing it not to break at all or break his fall. Well, you know, I don't endorse chair shots to the head. And the chair shot to the head last week was very bad. But you know what? He got hit with a chair last week, and he's back wrestling again. Whereas he went off the stage here through a table, and he didn't wrestle again for a while because he busted his ribs. He broke his ribs, they said. Yeah. Dear God. That was legit, too. I'm sure it was. He really fractured looked, his really, ribs. You watch this fall, especially when they showed the uh, almost like a crane shot from the stands. You saw really how, how far he jumped and how far he fell. I'm going to say this again, just watching this craziness, this absolute idiocy here. And it only got worse, by the way. They're doing all of this crazy shit, and they're doing all of this profanity and all of this Attitude Era stuff. And really, the only thing that's any good is still The Rock, Steve Austin, Shawn Michaels wrestling matches. Like, all of this Attitude Era stuff, am I just old? No. This it, stuff sucks. This, this show's terrible. This is a horrible, horrible show, with the exception of the things that are actually good professional wrestling. Yes. Clearly, nobody recognized it at the time. Even Vince didn't figure it out, doing that wacky promo that we'll get into here. Mark Henry versus the Brooklyn Brawler. We were told this was Henry's in-ring debut after missing more than a year with a broken ankle. And having watched him wrestle here, I believe it was his in-ring debut. That wasn't that bad. No, oh, no. But it looked like a big guy with a lot of training in his very first match. He won with a bear hug. His saxophone music was awesome. His saxophone <laughs> music was up there with Rick Rude's music. It was, yes. NWA, the fake music they gave him. Yes. God. I wonder if it's the same music. No. Very possible. Yeah. They should have just, should have just given it to him. Should bring it back now. I wonder how many matches the Brooklyn Brawler has had with a guy in his very first match. I bet a bunch. I bet a really lot, a, a whole, whole bunch. They recapped the Owen Hart saga, and then Vince came out for a promo. He says, Owen Hart, I know you're here tonight. You have been putting fans in danger by coming through the crowd to attack people. Oh, yeah? <laughs> oh, yeah? <laughs> you've, been, you've been walking amongst the people. They're in grave danger. And by it's not the like way, there are fights in the crowd. There's a Canadian in the crowd. <laughs> by the way, two weeks ago... Stone Cold drove his truck out to the arena, and Vince was chastising him for putting the fans in danger then. Yeah, who cares about your wrestlers? He had a much stronger case against Austin. Exactly. Yeah. Owen, he says, you are still under contract to the WWF. I order you to appear right now. Now, keep in mind, this is now the second hour. Much different from the first hour, when they wouldn't even say ass. Owen Hart, a big fan of the word ass. And others. He comes out to the crowd here. He eyes Vince in the apron. Fans were loudly chanting Owen's name. Vince completely unintimidated. He just has a job to do. Owen says he doesn't owe Vince a goddamn apology. Doesn't owe him a goddamn thing. The bullshit stops here. See Brian's comment about hour number two. Now, all this was bleeped. Yeah. But it was quite clear. But he said it in the crowd. What was going on yeah. here. He says, Brett, Neidhart, and Bulldog, they had all done what they had to do. Now I'm going to do what I have to do, and that's stay put in the WWF. I have spent nine years in this company breaking my back to make a reputation. No one's going to run me out of the company, and you know who I'm talking about, any points of Vince. Vince says, yes, you're talking about Shawn Michaels. <laughs> this was so awesome because they were on totally different pages in storyline. Owen said he wanted Shawn. And Vince McMahon, the promoter, says, Well, clearly, the, you just want to accomplish the one goal you've never accomplished here in the World Wrestling Federation to become the champion. And I was like, this is bullshit. I don't care about the belt. I want to beat this guy's ass. My brother, Brett, got fucked. He said, I do not give a damn about your stupid title. A piece of leather with tin on it. What's with tin? That is Vince Russo's favorite line ever. Apparently, tin is Vince Russo's favorite metal. I guess. <laughs> He says, this is real life. Maybe that's his birthstone. Tin. Because that would explain a lot. Metal's not a stone, Brian. Shut up, Craig. I'm just saying. Killed my joke. <laughs> well, it wasn't very good. <laughs> How <laughs> dare you? I had so many Tin Man jokes I was going to get into. That would have been better. And you Thank killed you, Craig. it. <laughs> I owe you a dollar. 
Owen says this is not about a stupid piece of leather with tin. This is real life. Tin, you say? He cared about what his is tin? dignity. Damn it. His it's, reputation. It's metal, Brian. He was there to no make shit, Sean's Craig. life a living hell. You can call him the sole survivor or the black sheep. It is a metal. Which I think we're supposed to say black heart. Let me write that down. Atomic number 50. He didn't give a shit. Sean started this. He was going to end it. Vince calls for uniform security. Out comes the biggest group of goofballs and cop costumes you ever saw. And Vince orders, next week, Owen Hart, you will come down the ramp like any other superstar. And Owen stares him down. He grabs him by the collars. And he lets go and he leaves. Why did the cops grab Owen when he was trying to assault Vince? I don't know. These guys well, are incompetent. They got so much wrong in this because segment. Because the cops were there to protect the fans. I not see. Vince McMahon. By the way, tin, Vince needs no protection. Tin is an element that is made up of the mineral cassiterite. Oh. So it is possible that cassiterite, which is mined from the crust of the earth, Watch is him. in fact Vince Russo's birthstone. Thank you all. Goddamn tin man. So, yeah, you had uh, the one guy who was there to beat up the promoter who screwed his brother, and they killed off that storyline. Cut it off? K killed it. Dead. Yeah, he's coming next week. He's going to have a match. Who could it be with? Let's see. Oh, God. You want to talk about kill dead? Let's talk about Sal Sincere. <laughs> the Sultan wrestled Tom Brandy. In storyline, this man... <laughs> was Sal Sincere. Mm -hmm. But last week, Mark Merrow came out, and he revealed to the world right. that that was not his real name. His real name was Tom Brandy. And because he revealed that, now he's Tom Brandy again. Right. He can't possibly come out with that fake gimmick. And Jim Cornette, James E. Cornette, actually said... Tom Brandy going by his real name is going to help him out in the long run. Huh. Because he's a great athlete. Hmm. We all make Whipped mistakes. Whipped on that one. We all make mistakes. But you know what? He was right in this match. Did you guys notice that the Sultan <laughs> is in there in his curly toed boots? Right. And his genie pants. And whatever that wacky mask he wore was. And also a great big giant watch. A watch, you say? You got to take his watch off. I couldn't notice the watch because I was fixated on his gear. They were striped. His his pants were striped. Mm -hmm. In fuchsia and pink. Vertical or horizontal? Vertical. Had to be. Okay. Yes. But it it resembled a circus tent. Yes. <laughs> it did. All I know is he's got this giant watch on and he goes to choke Tom Brandy in the ropes and the ref is giving him a five count, but it's not necessary because the Sultan is looking at his watch to make sure he breaks within five seconds. Well, they only had four minutes. You have to make sure you keep time. It's actually very smart. He checked his watch over and over and over again in this match. He, in the course of this match, he had a pile driver, a DDT, and a super kick that were not the finish. Trying to kill every finisher in one match. I did love when the Sultan got DDT'd and he just jumped right up and didn't sell it. Right. And Jim Ross, in attempting to save this sport, said his mask protected him. Sure. Yeah. Did, yeah. You, also, did you also notice A the spot? A DDT hurts your face, not your head, <laughs> not your neck. Justin noticed the spot where Tom was trying to pull both of his legs into the uh, ring post, but Sultan's giant backside was preventing him <laughs> from actually pulling it underneath the bottom turnbuckle. So... Brandy hits one neck breaker. He stops wrestling to go after the Iron Sheik. The Sultan charges. Brandy dodges. Sultan bonks into Sheik. Brandy hits a schoolboy for the win. And then the one thing I'll say about this, you would not believe this crowd reaction for Tom Brandy beating the Sultan. These people went nuts. Well, on a show filled with garbage, a baby face outsmarted two heels and was victorious in a wrestling match. And they went crazy for it. And backstage, Vince Russo shook his head. <laughs> what the fuck? I don't get it. Let's make him Italian again. 
We had he, oh, Mark Burrow ran out and nutshotted Brandy and whipped his ass, and he crowd chanted for Sable. A Steve Austin highlight reel video. And the nation came back out. Rock said, Austin, your time is up. You are too gutless to show. Next thing you know, we are on a bridge somewhere. And Austin has the intercontinental belt. And he starts throwing stuff off the bridge into the water below. Cell phones and pagers and scuba equipment. All of this, he says, Rock's going to need it to find the intercontinental title. And finally, he takes the belt and says, this hurts what I'm about to do. But I don't give a damn about you, Rock. I don't give a damn about the WWF. And he throws the belt into the water. People were chilled. People cheered for all this. The Rock was beyond outraged. I could have sworn that this ended with them fighting on the bridge. No. No? Isn't Am there a my mind? second angle where Rock goes to throw something of Austin's off a bridge? Late Maybe down the that's line. what it was. I believe so. I could be wrong. You know what really made me sad about this is... I believe this is the beginning of the end for this belt. That also occurred to me. Oh, my I think, God. I think that we, just, we just saw for the last time. I think when Rock gets his new belt, it's the new belt, which they kept for 20 years. It's lame. Until Cody, of all people. Cody saved the Intercontinental title. That's his legacy, bringing the real Intercontinental belt back. What, he swim out and find it? Well, Cody getting a new belt that looked like the old belt. I back. He just recommissioned it. He may have. What a skit that would have been. He's on the internet. Go in a... A belt site. <laughs> Have you clicked? Skit. I've done it. All right. Was this or was this not the wackiest segment in the history of Monday Night Raw? I nearly vomited when Vince McMahon gave his promo. <sighs> like, I remember it happening and I knew it was coming. And yet, once it started, I still couldn't believe my eyes. You know what's weird is... I have been going back and kind of doing a cursory glance through the observers. I'm not reading every issue or anything like that. I'm more trying to watch these shows as a fan. And there was so much stuff going on behind the scenes that led to stuff like this stupid promo. But man, when you try to watch this show as a fan, this stuff just comes out of nowhere and it's preposterous. Right. Yeah. Like... When you're only watching the show every week, and then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, Jim Cornette's coming on ranting about some writer in a newspaper, it's like, what? Why are you... Who's Phil Mushnick, and why are you ranting about him? And then, like, in the middle of Raw, one day, Vince McMahon just shows up to tell us that, hey, this is a TV show, like... Days of Our Lives, I think he used. And Seinfeld. He Seinfeld. Said part soap opera, part sitcom, part ca part cartoon. And I'm watching it going, what are you talking about? What like, why are you telling me this? What is going on here? He was basically making an excuse for all the foul stuff that you're going to see as a parent. And by the way, viewer at home, this is fake. Yes. This was so stupid. I mean, we had talked about this for a long time first of all he'd also been playing hard ass in the ring with owen hart like an hour ago now he's smiling happy vince he says we are sports entertainment the entertainment part is most important fans no longer want their intelligence insulted he says yeah they no longer want good guys and bad guys never mind that the best stuff on this show involves good guys and bad guys I don't want my intelligence salted, but a couple weeks ago, I saw a man crawling on his hands and knees on a dog leash with a ball gag in his mouth. Dude, I saw the Barique was on TV every week. That's far more insulting to my intelligence. He also said the WWF had survived for 50 years by changing. Now, this is relevant because perhaps some of you have read uh, the name of Vince McMahon or even his wife, Linda, in a current events news story in the past week or two and you may have seen her identified as a co-founder now this is news to anyone listening but that is complete bullshit so anyway yes he said this was wacky sure was this goddamn segment was wacky yeah. Steve Blackman versus Jose it's just amazing this is what happened <laughs> it's like it was so fitting that this stupid promo should be followed by this match. It's My like, intelligence is insulted. Your show is getting destroyed in the ratings by Nitro. And so you're coming on television 
and you're crying about it and you're justifying the changes you're going to make and then you follow that up immediately with the goddamn most horrendous match you could put on television like how about instead of doing stupid promos and insider bullshit you just tried to make a good show i'd really like to see a good monday night raw this show is horrible with the exception of as noted steve austin the rock and Shawn michaels steve blackman and a bariqua in the middle of a wrestling war talk about the jose or hose b joke that's what this was this could have been anybody Steve had a bunch of kicks and a German suplex for the win. Millions changed the channel. DX did a backstage promo making fun of Owen. Bragged about running all the hearts out of the company. They said it should be China's turn to beat somebody, but that would not be fair to Owen. So they did rock, paper, scissors, and Hunter won. And so he gets the honor of fighting Owen, which means Owen came back to the company and never even had a shot of a raw main event, let alone a paper you main event. They showed a clip from Shotgun of Taker defeating Sultan, which I would not reference here, except Taker won this match by picking up the giant fat man and hitting a one-armed tombstone. Holy shit! That was nuts. DX versus LOD. This is the Road Warrior team <laughs> that I remember at the first part of this show. The first part of this match, excuse me. Tell right. me more. Well, <clears throat> excuse me. The Road Warriors were made to look kind of like a joke. They've been wrestling the hog farmers and such. Headbangers. Headbangers, thank you. Bikers. And uh, Africans. when Triple H and Shawn Michaels got in there, they remembered the matches that the Road Warriors had had with, oh, I don't know, the Four Horsemen. And the Road Warriors came in there and they looked like a million bucks. Only to be made look like fools by the end of this. But it... You're, I, a, you're I, a very I, kind man, Craig. I thought this was great. Let's talk about what really happened here. Okay. So, Sean goes in there, and it doesn't matter who he's in the ring with. He bounces around like a pinball. Right. He did that for these guys. But Hawk was so horrible in this match. He was so horrible. I think you need to go back and actually watch some of that NWA with the Road Warriors killing jobbers. Hawk, li listen, Animal did okay. I'll give I'll give Animal credit. Hawk was hideous in this match, and yes, it was a one man show with Shawn Michaels early. Mm -hmm. This, yeah, th th this was my takeaway. I, I, I'm I'm I am fascinated. We all have three different takeaways for this match, but mine, as Brian referenced earlier, Shawn Michaels wrestling matches was one of the very few unfuckable up things on Raw. You can't fuck up Shawn Michaels' wrestling matches. He was so awesome. You know what's funny, too? All of his buddies are on Nitro, and they don't do a goddamn thing. Right. And they're making so much money. Yeah. Shawn Michaels, he didn't have to do anything. He would have still been the top guy in this company. He would have still been the champion. He could have done a quarter of the stuff that he did in the ring. But this guy was obsessed with being the best. Yes. And he would go in there and he fucking practically killed himself. And I don't want to say it's for no good reason, because I really enjoyed watching Shawn Michaels' matches. But it is amazing to see how hard this guy worked in every single match with everybody. And he didn't have to. Pretty much. Yeah, I could have watched the first five minutes of this match on a loop for about six hours and not gotten bored. So, finally... Here's an example of perfect timing. Sean ducks down as Hawk is running the ropes, and Hawk trips over him. Oh my god, Hawk's just stumbling. But it works, though, because it was this spot where he was going to get the cheap shot from the apron anyway. So it all fit together. Hawk looked like a wild boar <laughs> barreling through the brush during this spot. Yes. Just wiping out branches and twigs. So they work over Hawk for a while. And oh my god. Can we stop with the Hawk babyface in peril? <laughs> I mean, it's just so terrible. Eventually, they do the hot tag, and almost immediately, the outlaws appear, and they jump Hawk with the ether-soaked rag. Oh, man. I think they got him with that before the match. 
<laughs> Animal beats up DX by himself for a while until China hits a nut shot for the DQ. It was awesome. Animal single-handedly. Animal lifts... Had to have been... Maybe it was Hunter. Animal lifts one of them up onto his shoulders for the Doomsday device, mm -hmm. but Hawk's not there. So, Hawk's got this dude on his shoulders, and the other DX guy runs at him, and Hawk boots him with one leg, yeah, that was and then does an electric chair. Yeah, he had Sean on his shoulders and hit... That was so awesome. It was yeah. awesome. Animal believably beat up two men by himself. The world and he champion was, and a he sidekick. He was winning the match before China ran in and yeah. hit him in the nubbin. <laughs> Just let it go, Vince. <laughs> so, the outlaws throw Hawk into the ring. They shave off one of Hawk's mohawks. If anything, they did him a favor. <laughs> yes. <laughs> DX is very impressed and entertained by this. Yeah. They all decided it was time to take care of Animal 2, hit a quadruple power bomb off the apron through a table. <laughs> Can I talk about that for a second? We see so many crazy spots nowadays, and dudes are just getting injured left and right. So they're going to give Animal a power bomb off the apron through the announce table. There's four men. They all grab Animal. And literally, it takes 30 seconds for everybody to get in position. And then, Shawn Michaels, of all people, goes, All right, ready? One, two, <laughs> three! And they lift him up and they powerbomb him through. And I was like, I couldn't even believe my eyes. <laughs> like, they were being so careful yes. to do this stunt. Mm -hmm. That's what it was. Yeah. <laughs> One, two, three! <laughs> Did you notice the week before the end of the uh, strip poker segment when... Hey, the same thing. Sean is directing Hunter, I want to be on the hard camera. Go to that corner. Oh, yeah. Is that what he said? Yes. Oh. Right, right before Owen came out. That's even better. So he should have been on the hard camera. But This guy should be a director. This guy should take over for Kevin Dunn. Yes. Immediately. So they still beat up Hawk. Billy hits his top rope leg drop. And Sean, of course, says, that was an eight. Let me show you a ten. And he hit his top rope elbow. That was a real... That was a shoot right there. <laughs> that was Sean saying, I will show you a 10. The Outlaws at this point literally said goodbye. We are going to go party with our belts. And they left. And the show closed with Sean smiling at them and saying, not bad. And then the Outlaws would not join DX for another four months. God, this is so eye-opening watching these old shows. At this point, I actually wrote down a fun show. Clearly, I was referring only to the main event. The main mm -hmm. event stuff was fun. Yeah, that's Except why. Except for Hawk. <laughs> poor Hawk. Yeah, poor Hawk. But I'm not going to pretend he was any good in this match. He was terrible. Sean and Hunter made the Road Warriors look like a million bucks, and that's really what I... Th and mostly Sean. Well, yeah. Hunter was there, and his hair flew all over. He's got great hair. Ah. Uh, We'll start with a show that was merely lousy. They recapped the Legion of Doom getting taken out by DX and the New Age Outlaws the week before. They called this pair unlikely allies. That amused me. Seems like they had a lot in common. It's not a very good name for a team. The unlikely allies? Cesaro and Sheamus, isn't it? So DX comes out for a promo. I don't know where they were, <laughs> but their production values seem to take about 20 years step backward in time there's something really weird about this show i i noticed immediately that usually there was something weird there was something weird in the sense that it was it was a square the building was tiny no i'm talking about the, the actual so it was it was a four three aspect ratio right but usually when you watch on the ipad and you kind of back away from it there was something really weird about this when it stayed a square like, it was like they cut out the corners of it for some reason when they put it together. I don't know what happened, but it looked hideous. This show looked hideous. It was a small building. It was dark. The audio had problems all night long. I was going to say the production team must have taken a break for the holidays. It, maybe. It was very clearly edited, usually not very well. This looked, in all honesty, there, there would have been, well, maybe not this era of ECW, but the later era ECW shows would have looked just like this. Same building that uh, Sean lost his smile in, as we learned later. You know what it looked like? It looked like, it looked like it looked like they didn't have a copy of the show, and so they got a videotape from like Dave, and <laughs> digitized it from that. Maybe one way or the other, it looked terrible. So DX comes out for a promo. There's falling snow because it's Christmas, and they are in bathrobes because they are DX. 
Jim Ross is hinting about what might be under these robes. He promises they are prepared. So they brag about taking out the Road Warriors. They're not going to let the Outlaws take credit for their, their kill. Warn the Outlaws to stay out of their way. Hunter called Owen Hart a baby. Said he had a pacifier for Owen to suck on. Sean moved on to Undertaker, who had failed to beat Sean twice. I was going to fail again at the Royal Rumble. This show had to set the record for the most dick jokes in two hours. <laughs> Seriously. It was like everybody. Mm -hmm. Hunter, Sean, both announcers. Am I missing anybody? There had to be more. We'll Gold dust. Gold dust. All night long. It was one dick joke after another. So eventually they say we have a present for the fans and they strip to their thongs. Women in the crowd were awfully happy for being honest. Sergeant Slaughter came out. <laughs> okay. Remember what I said last week? I already watched half of the show. So the, I watched this uh, like eight days ago. So I forget exactly the context. But, but what I wrote here is Sergeant Slaughter came out and Sean made jokes about how Sarge would want to have sex with him. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where you got that. Huh. Something about. Where did you get that? Did you tell them to suck it? No, I don't think so. Hunter I, did. Maybe that was Hunter made some comment about his lollipop. Maybe that's what I was thinking of. Yeah, what are you talking about? I don't know. So, Sarge says, Shawn Michaels, you have not defended the European title in more than 60 days. Shawn says, I've been busy. I like that. It's true. Remember that whole thing that went down at the European pay-per-view where Shawn beat Bulldog in his hometown with yeah. his dying sister there? Yeah. Yeah. 60 days. Hasn't <laughs> defended the title a single time. Can't wait to get rid of it. Yeah. Every every time he has referenced it since winning, it, he always sarcastically calls it the coveted European title. <laughs> and everybody, I listen to people going, Brian, Sean had to win. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah. What a great follow-up they had to that. He had to win so that he could do nothing with it forever. So Sean says, defend the title tonight or I will strip you of it. Sean says, I do not surrender belts to anyone. Hmm. I laughed and I laughed and I laughed. So Sarge books Sean versus Hunter for the title tonight. DX is pissed. They had a panicked huddle. Hunter says, Sarge, you're trying to ruin Sean's Christmas by putting him in position to lose to me. Sean says, wait, wait, wait. I don't lay down for anybody. And the music played, and they were jabbering, and China was trying to make peace. At the beginning here, I mean, I guess it was 97, but who in the world couldn't see this coming? It does seem... It seems preposterous. From the get-go. That, like, they thought that we would think, oh, now they're going to really fight. Yeah. And then, I think as the show went on, they realized, this is so ridiculous, because later, Hunter cut a promo on Sean, which was, I would say, 80% comedy. And then after that, Sean cut a promo on Hunter, which was a clear 100% <laughs> comedy. The and then the announcers had to act like they'd been fooled. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah? <laughs> oh, I'll, we'll get into that. You idiots. We'll get into that. The announcers talked for a while in front of the worst green screens of all time. Headbangers versus Godwins. Michael Cole Im ambushed the Godwins with an interview. Said, Every time I see the Headbangers and the Hog Farmers and <laughs> DOA and the Bariquas. I just think about all of these stupid documentaries that WWE puts on the WWE Network, and they make all of these excuses for why they were losing in the Monday Night Wars. They talk about Ted Turner's money and stealing talent, and it's like, it's these fucking hog farmers, and the Bariquas, and DOA, and all of this shit. Who could possibly watch this? Who could possibly watch... How do they not lose every single viewer when the hog farmers face the headbangers? Honestly. Like, who chose to watch this show at that point? Do they not have TBS? Like, what's the excuse or TNT? Well, it turned out it was a singles match between Henry Godwin and Thrasher. It went a minute and everyone ran in for the DQ. I hated this so much, I didn't even know that. <laughs> I didn't I, even know it was a singles match. Yeah. I was blind I was blinded with rage. Yes. And I just wrote Hog Farmers versus Headbangers, this fucking show. Well, there's That's more what to I come. got out of this. More to come. The Godwins laid the headbangers out and whipped them to set up a strap match as if anyone could possibly want to see that. Oh, did they really? Yes. God damn it. I'm so sick of these. All four of these teams can just leave and never come back. It's a really awful tag team division they had right now. 
Mankind cut a promo from the bowels of the building somewhere. He said it was interesting that when you broke dude loves ribs, his hurt too. He said, it want, he, he said he wanted to drink eggnog around the fire and make the Yuletide gay. He promised to give the outlaws a beating tonight. You could tell that Mick Foley would someday play Santa during this promo. All sorts of holiday references and Christmas songs. More, more to come later. Yeah. Although he was not the best Santa on the show. No. <laughs> there were a lot of Santas on this show. There actually were. And he certainly was not the best. Speaking of, they showed footage from after Raw had ended last week. Apparently, Steve Austin threw the Intercontinental title in a river and then drove back to the building. Santa Claus came out and called out Sable. They brought a little girl into the ring. Santa called her a little boy repeatedly. That was their idea of comedy. She accused him of not being the real Santa Claus. Santa got pissed, sent her back into the crowd. Steve Austin came out. They talked about Barbie dolls and tiddlywinks, and eventually, after way too long, Austin gave Santa a stunner. Austin played this audience like a fiddle. They were eating out of his hand. He was so awesome. Santa took this amazing bump. But this was like totally not badass Steve Austin. This was friendly babyface Steve Austin. On the whole, yeah. And it's like they filmed it off TV, and then I guess decided, God, that was great. Let's put it on television. Oh, my kill Steve's character? Doesn't matter. Otherwise, we've got to put more hog farmers on television. I think he'll be fine. He ended up being okay. Bullets dodged. They went backstage where you could hear Sean and Hunter yelling at each other from inside the locker room. Rock versus Undertaker. Rock from pretty much day one was a great TV star. It was even more clear later in the show. But let us not forget that before Rock became an awesome wrestler, he was a really, really boring wrestler. He did a lot of punching. He did a lot of kicking. A lot of nerve pinching. <laughs> he took like 80% of this match till the finish. Yeah. That's so weird is Undertaker's still around, kind of. And I say kind of, that's the key to this. It's so weird watching a show where the Undertaker just randomly shows up and wrestles on a regular basis. Yes. It's like, what's this guy doing here again? <laughs> just coming up for a random match with the dude in the nation. He was a main eventer. Yeah, he was like a regular character. Yeah. So weird now. I never see the guy. It was. I didn't think about this until Craig just brought this up. But in most Randy Savage matches, he would sell for three minutes or four minutes or five minutes or however long the match went. Till tonight. And then do like one body slam with the elbow and win. It's basically what Taker did here. He sold and sold and sold. Hit a choke slam and a tombstone. But then Kane came out. Sadly, not the Christmas creature from USWA. Rock of the Nation just disappeared. God, did you see the Christmas creature at Country Village? The Frosty? Frosty the Snowman you had a picture oh of? Oh, my God. There's an abomination, everyone, patrolling oh my Country God. Village. <laughs> and then when I put her on Santa's lap, I've never seen a meltdown like when she got put on Santa's lap. Paisley, young Paisley's first Santa photo. I say this with love. First thing I thought is, hell baby. <laughs> <laughs> she was so mad. And that was the second one. Really? <laughs> yeah, we tried We tried the first one. Didn't work, and the second one was even worse. And then charm. we got to choose, and it's like, man, this one's a classic. <laughs> we'll keep this one for prom. But anyway, Country Village has been such a horror for this poor baby, and when you see, <laughs> when you see this picture it's of like her... Like antique shops and bakeries. And <laughs> horrified at Frosty the Snowman, you didn't hear Frosty. Oh my god. I thought of Vinny because of the movie Jack Frost. Oh, jeez. I guarantee this dude was scarier than Jack the Frost. The horror movie Jack Frost. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's man. That's a good movie. This guy was way worse. I was praying he would just melt. Well, I think one of the girls on that movie came out to be somebody famous later. I'll look that up here. Anyway, Paul Bear says, Undertaker, your parents are celebrating Christmas with maggots and worms. Taker goes after Paul. Kane goes after Taker. Taker blocks a punch, but he refuses to fight back. So Kane beats the crap out of him, leaves Taker laying, and sets off Kane's Spyro. Triple H was going to wrestle Shawn Michaels here, but Owen Hart jumped Hunter in the aisle way. This forced Shawn and China to make the save. Owen got pulled away. DX accused Sarge of being in charge of this. Sarge denied everything, but he had a huge smile, and they went to break. So we're supposed to believe that they were going to put Triple H versus Shawn Michaels... 
Shawn Michaels is the world and European champion. The European title is on the line against his partner in DX. They're going to put that at the top of the hour. And the main event of the show is going to be Ken Shamrock versus D'Lo Brown. I don't buy it. Shannon Elizabeth was in Jack Frost. Oh. She had some fame later or something. I forget what now. American Pie, right? Oh, yeah. That's it. Yeah. She was in Jack Frost first. And that Jack Frost, by the way, came out before the Michael Keaton version. So they stole this idea. Oh, and to answer your question, Brian, I think Triple H and Shawn Michaels, maybe it was going to go an hour. Had to block out plenty of time. I see. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. A bunch of dumb skits aired with the New Age Outlaws, where they were hunting mankind. <laughs> They're in the unused parts of the building. They had mining helmets and headlamps on. They were tiptoeing. So they go in this... This stuff is so <laughs> bad. They go into this big room that's dark, and it's only lit up by their headlamps, which means we on television can't see anything. It was like Inspector Clouseau looking for Cato when he got home. That was much better than this. That's true. This was... I don't even know. They found a guy they thought was Mankind. They jumped him and beat him up. They turned on the lights. It wasn't Mankind, and so they ran away. What they should have done is done what the Heart Foundation did just last spring. <laughs> When they thought it was Steve Austin, they beat him up, they realized it wasn't Steve Austin, and then they beat him up more anyway. That was awesome. Mark Merrow versus Scott Taylor. Brian is rubbing his temples right now. We haven't even gotten to the bad stuff yet. This show is so horrible. <laughs> this is an <laughs> awful show. And it's much better than Nitro. It's much better than Raw Monday. I sure it was. I know nothing about what happened on Raw, by the way. You the first nothing. half hour I thought was so horrible. And now I look back and it's just typical WWE bad comedy. Mm -hmm. But this show is outright horrible. So they were piping in as many stable chants as they could. Marrow said he had a present to, uh, he, he had a present for the fans, called out Sable, who came out in a complete reindeer costume, complete with deer head. <laughs> She's completely obscured, head to toe. Like a mascot. In a Rudolph costume. Whose nose does, in fact, blink red. Yeah. And she's wearing high heels. Yes. <laughs> I was like, Sable is, she is displaying more athleticism <laughs> here than any of the cruiserweights I've ever seen on this show. How in the world did she maneuver around in that outfit with those high heels on? Talent. So, he ordered her to leave the ring in her reindeer costume. I, I don't know what I was expecting, but I was, I was certain this was not Sable. And then she took the reindeer head off. And it was Sable. All right. So the match was nothing. Mero won with the TKO. He went after Scott Taylor afterwards, but Tom Brandy ran out to make the save. That's when it just hit me. Mark, Mero, Scott, Taylor, Tom, Brandy in one segment. <laughs> and Lytra was still worse. So let's see. Mabel, uh, Mabel, Sable. Thank God. Mabel. Thank God. Sable stripped to a bikini. You. Eh. You mistook. Or not any Santa's little Sable. Helper outfit. Yeah, yeah. For Mabel. I didn't mis mistake. I, I misspoke. Mabel couldn't have pulled this outfit off, that's for sure. Mabel would have needed more than one reindeer. Anyway, Sable stripped to a Santa's little helper getup and grabbed a mic and wished everyone Merry Christmas. I love that she comes out in this reindeer outfit and she's very much like a luchador. She is completely obscured in a giant reindeer head, and she's still able to look so sad with the costume on. So she's outside the ring. Mark Camaro gets thrown out by Tom Brandy, following his match with Scott Taylor. He goes down holding his knee, and as soon as Sable sees that her man is down and injured, <laughs> she literally cannot help but take all her clothes off. <laughs> That's the storyline here. She's a serial stripper. <laughs> and man these geeks going insane in the audience it's like they'd never seen a woman before where were they like in a prison i don't know there was a guy in the front row who's screaming at her and he's reaching his arms like he's trying to grab and pull her towards him mm -hmm. i'm like dude they go backstage where triple h is cutting a promo he's wearing a china shirt and she is at his side Saying he's going to kick Sean's ass later. 
And she keeps whispering in his ear. And he says, no, no, no. Sean needs to learn a lesson and I'm going to teach it to him. <laughs> I don't know. Dude. <laughs> the rise and fall of WCW. The Monday Night War DVD. All of these talking heads. All their bullshit about why Nitro won for 86 straight weeks or 83 weeks or whatever. Let's talk about why Nitro won for 83 straight weeks. I'm sure... At some point in 2016, I have seen a match worse than 8-Ball versus Kurgan. No, you haven't. But none come to mind. <laughs> it's impossible. This I mean, was you so just have to say what the match was. Terrible. No, eight it was ball. worse than you would think. No. It, no. 8-Ball versus Kurgan. This happened. <laughs> they put this on television. No, let me tell you something. It was on a tape show. On Raw Monday, on Raw Monday, they come back from commercial, and Sin Cara... And Titus O'Neil are in the ring. And I was like, hmm. Sin fucking Kara and Titus O'Neil are going to have a match. No way. And guess what? They didn't. Huh. But they put 8-Ball and Kurgan in the ring, and they did. Oh, yeah. In the middle of a wrestling war. Fucking hideous. So, yes, this was as terrible. More. As a match could be. I don't know. <laughs> All I know is Kurgan eventually won with a side slam, and he could barely do that right. A side slam. Anyone can do this. <laughs> not no, Kurgan. Apparently not. Who, by the way, is much bigger than his opponent. DOA came out. He, like, mission. lifted him and then stumbled sideways until he fell on him. That was his side slam. Yeah. I think a man of that size would have a little more strength. Apparently not. DOA and Truth Commission got into a brawl. The bikers cleared the ring with a two by four, threatening more matches. Ugh. <sighs> Best thing in this match was the Jackal. When he came out to the ring, he's now putting jewels on young ladies' foreheads. Yes. Charms. Not his, but charms. Yes, thank yeah. you. That's what he's, he's charming them. It's part of his cult leader persona. Right. The Outlaws were hunting for mankind again. At least the first skit had the payoff where they beat up the wrong guy. Literally nothing happened here. D'Lo Brown versus Ken Shamrock. Match went like two minutes. This is the best match on the show. Sure. <laughs> High praise. Total squash. Was Shamrock. it really? Yeah. Ah, back here. I'm sure it was. Maybe Undertaker versus The Rock was better. No, that was boring. This was at least short. This, Dude, was, this went two minutes. Two minutes and 26 exactly. seconds, and it was better. Rock and, two, Rock and Taker went two hours. Christ, the state of this show. This is a poor show. So Shamrock wins with the ankle lock. Rock comes out to cut a promo. What the hell got into him here? He says, I am here to talk about the Gulf crisis. And everyone stops and he says, forget about that Gulf crisis. I'll tell you about it later. <laughs> what in the hell? What in the hell's going on in this show? I don't know. Then the heel challenges the baby face yeah. to a match at the Royal Rumble and offers to put his title on the line. Yes. What? <laughs> that all happened. <laughs> So the payoff to all this is Shamrock's like, he's going, because the nation have been like jumping on the apron. So he goes from fight mode. He's all tense. His fists are balled up. He's ready to go. And like a minute later, he's like, this is great. What a wonderful day I'm having. I got a win and I got a title match coming up. What a swerve. So Rock Let's says. Let's have the heel go out and challenge the baby face and offer to put his title on the line like a fighting champion. So the Rock says, nation come to the back. And Kama and D'Lo go right away, but Farouk is very reluctant. Sean did the same thing Hunter did later, cutting a promo while China whispered in his ear. I mean, this was, like, past the point of comedy. <laughs> yes, you're right. The outlaws were still in the basement. Mankind jumped them and destroyed them while singing Christmas carols. In this arena, in a random room in the arena... They found a huge walk-in freezer. And I, I swear to God, this isn't even on them. This is the building. There is a walk-in freezer in the middle of this big space. It's not like it's next to the kitchen. It's just there. And they locked mankind in the freezer. Okay. Oh, boy. So, I had forgotten this, but uh, I, one of the great moments, at least in the history of our show, involved gold dust and a Christmas tree. That tree was made out of barbed wire. Mm -hmm. That's right. I forgot he was in that match. This tree was himself. 
He came out dressed as a Christmas tree. He was there to read the nightmare, uh, nightmare, the night before Christmas. Was this like supposed to be good? I can't imagine. No, because it wasn't. Do you mean his his performance or the segment as a whole? I think the idea was he was supposed to be so irritating you would he'd be happy to see him get beat up. But. Huh. Goldust has now added the stereotypical gay lisp. Yes. Yes. Very offensive. Dick yes. jokes, ball jokes, weed jokes. Yeah, there were all of these. So he's reading Night Before Christmas until Santa Claus interrupts. This was the only good thing on <laughs> the whole show. That's probably true. It's a great big Santa Claus, that's for sure. He was a big fat Santa. And he's giving out the presents. So Goldust first says, what are you doing? Get out of here. And then just ignores him and goes back to reading Night Before Christmas. And then Santa hits the ring. Santa absolutely waylays Goldust with his sack. Oh my god, he swung that thing. <laughs> Goldust must have done something to Vader in one of their views. <laughs> Maybe he really hit him with the hammer or something. And Vader's like, now's my chance. I'm going to give this fucking guy a receipt. I'm going to put an anvil in this sack. Swing it as hard as I can. And they show like 15 replays of this sack hitting Goldust in the back of the head. Him flying. Yeah. An anvil. Yeah. It's Looney Tunes. Actually, don't, yes! yeah. yeah, don't answer that. So Santa stopped Goldust menacingly, laid him out with a clothesline, Goldust left, and then Santa revealed himself to be Vader. Vader in a Santa outfit with his music playing. Yes. And his mask underneath. That's the goddamn best Christmas present I've ever gotten. <laughs> they showed him, they were, they were showing replays, and there was a shot. He had, he, had, he had hit Goldust, but hadn't revealed himself yet. So all it was was mean, angry Santa stalking Goldust like a dinosaur. It would have been totally preposterous to take the title off Sean, but honest to God, if they would have done some wacky DX deal and DX is doing some sort of goofy gimmick where Sean's going to wrestle Santa for the world title in the main event, and right before the match, they cut backstage and the fake Santa's all beat up and bloody, <laughs> and fucking Vader comes out dressed as Santa and just <laughs> beats the shit out of Sean and pins him for the title, I'd have totally bought it. Oh, awesome. I wouldn't have even blinked. It would have been so great. So we got Shawn Michaels versus Triple H. They stalled forever. They stretched on the ropes repeatedly. They both went to China for advice. They were messing with some fans. And then they do a lockup, and Shawn goes down like he has been shot. And Hunter does the silliest rope running ever. It's funny you should say that. <laughs> I thought that Hunter, fake running the ropes, still did it better than at least a couple <laughs> of WWE main <laughs> roster stars in 2016. Probably. <laughs> He was trying. He was moving. He, he was. Just, they were exaggerated steps and everything, yeah. but this man was hitting the ropes. He was running the ropes. He wasn't running like they were made of barbed wire. No. He wasn't jogging. No. He was doing some super high knees, but he was hitting these ropes. Then he does that, the gentle splash where you jump up and then land on your feet and then fall down. Vinny knows that one. I do. Oh, <laughs> believe me, I do. And he covers Sean, the ref counts three, at which, po at which point Jim Cornette is like he pulled a string on his back. It was a ruse, a ploy, a plot, a plan, a charade, a conspiracy, a sham. We've been conned, hoodwinked, bamboozled, flimflammed, had the wool pulled over our eyes even. Jim Cornette knew exactly how stupid this was. <laughs> I wanted to let you, the viewer, know that he knew how stupid it was. But then they both had to talk about how they fell for it. It's like, man, must you kill their credibility? So Sean is despondent and speaking through tears. It was not easy to be defeated for the coveted European title. Just burying his buddy Hunter's new belt all the way down the drain. Never been more emotionally and physically draining than this. More than any ladder or cage match he's ever been in. And finally they hugged and Ross says, oh, he's lost his smile. Hunter says, apart from his kids being born, it's the greatest moment of his life. And Sean's carrying him around and Sarge comes out to watch. And Sarge, apparently, I was told, I didn't hear him say anything. But he didn't. He did. It was just not into any microphone. It was really cool the way he they just did it. mumbled it. <laughs> All right. They announced Hunter versus Owen for next week. So the storyline was, the babyface commissioner got the last laugh, even though the heels thought they got the last laugh. That's it. I like the way they did this. He, the commissioner was standing there watching these two idiots in the ring, and just 
no mic or anything like that. He's just grinning from ear to ear. And Sarge says, next week, you'll be wrestling Owen Hart. It's actually a very good Sergeant Slaughter impression. Thank you. Well. Raw number 240, December 29th, 1997. Still in the gap in between Christmas and New Year's and still pretty evident they really weren't trying that hard with the show. So Goldust and Luna come out. And it's gold dust is baby new year, which means, yes, it's Dustin Rhodes in a diaper on my TV. Oh, yeah. And he says he's entering himself in the Royal Rumble. He runs down Steve Austin for a while, pulls out a sequined black thong and says that he can be the Barbie doll and Austin can be Ken. I like the idea that the gold dust character thought that when he came out with a thong for Steve Austin, that maybe it would be a good idea. This will turn out well for me, he thought. Oh, yeah. I'll humiliate my opponent, and he'll he'll be psychologically damaged, and I'll defeat him. So Austin comes out. He is dressed in blue jeans and a vest with no shirt on. He's clearly not dressed to wrestle. He rants and rambles for a bit and says, Goldust, I have a present for you. And then something very, very slowly begins to lower from the ceiling. It's a large thing. You can't tell what it is, but it's lowering. It's going slowly. Austin is clearly ad-libbing a promo on Goldust to, to fill time. And finally, everyone realizes whatever the hell this thing is, it's not going to hit the ring. So Steve Austin has, a, has to grab a rope. And this is a large man. He's pulling with all his might. He's putting all his weight to lean on this rope and pull whatever the hell this thing is into the ring. You know what was amazing about this was, did they not test this out like one time before they went live? <laughs> exactly. You know what I mean? Like, they didn't, they didn't try one time to lower it from the ceiling. They just had it in the ring, raised it up, and thought, eh, this will be a piece of cake. I swear to God, it was a full minute just to lower it to Steve Austin's head height. It, w it was at least another minute to get it into the ring. And keep in mind, as we get going here, what the payoff to all of this was. Yeah. So Austin by himself gets it into the ring safely. Once it's down, then suddenly there's ring crew guys everywhere to get the cables and curtains and everything out of the way. After two and a half, maybe even three minutes of this descent, the big reveal is there is a porta potty in the ring. I will summarize what happened next. It took a long time. But Steve Austin beat up Goldust, threw him in the porta potty, and then tipped it over. Yeah. And that was the end. I think it was a couple of weeks ago. I wish Craig were here, actually, so I could ask him this. I believe Goldust came out with, like, a ball gag and some other bullshit. And yeah. Craig said, do you remember when he was Baby New Year? And I, if I recall correctly, you and I both said, no, I don't remember that. Yeah. Well, this was it. And quite frankly, I know why I didn't remember. Because when it was over, I tried to block this out of my mind as quickly as humanly possible. Now, I will say this. I fully expected that when he was thrown into the porta potty, he would come out just covered. Yeah. And they didn't do it. They actually, amazingly, astoundingly, did not do that joke. He just got thrown in and he fell out and he got thrown in again and he fell out again. That was the whole segment. No, I'm very happy and. Relieved, if I can coin a phrase, uh, that they did not convince us that he used porta potty having hanging above the arena all day. Now, I do also like the idea that the character Stone Cold Steve Austin. Now, keep in mind, on all of their weekend shows back when WWF used to have weekend shows, on all of their weekend shows, they were plugging Steve Austin versus Gold Dust as one of the Raw main events. They like were actively sure. promoting it as a match. So. I guess in our minds we're supposed to think that Steve Austin is such a big he's such a big star that he wrestles when he wants who he wants and this weekend he just got to thinking and he went out and he found himself a porta potty yeah and he found himself some dudes who were going to hang it above the ring and this was stone cold Steve Austin's plan with how he was going to deal with gold dust Sure. Just Why not? Ungodly horrible segment. I can't believe they weren't kicked off USA Network for this. Well, it may have been better than the next segment. Los Barricos versus DOA. I am 100% certain I would rather watch the Barricos rap than wrestle. 
It was a six-man tornado match just to guarantee it would be no good at all whatsoever. They very casually announced that Crush had left the company after Kane had beat him up. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. I probably watched that Steve Austin segment. I said, fuck this. <laughs> no, I guess apparently Kane really hurt him when he came out and destroyed the DOA. Oh, and and Crush got really mad that he got hurt. Crush, I might add, got really mad that yeah. he got hurt. And he quit. Huh. Yeah. Well, that sucks. So, uh, let's see. Guys were doing spots in the middle of the ring. They couldn't even have guys brawl on the floor while two guys did spots in the ring. They had guys brawling in the corners of the ring while, while the others were trying to do spots. So everyone's in each other's way. There's four Barricos and three DOA. Eventually, the interference backfired. Savio kicked, I believe, Jose, and Chains pinned him for the win. It sucked. I've said this before. I will say it again. They're in the middle of a wrestling war. They're getting their asses handed to them by Nitro. The biggest pay-per-view in the history of wrestling just took place, and it was a WCW pay-per-view. And every time I see the Bariquas and the DOA come out on television, I swear to God, it is so much worse than the continued push of Roman Reigns that everybody bitches about today. Lord, yes. This fucking guy will not give up on the DOA and the Bariquas. It's death television. Like, every time they're on screen, it's television death. And he just keeps putting them on TV every single week. Mind-blowing. Let's see. Triple H have been scheduled on the show to defend his European title against Owen Hart. And lose. Well, that explains a lot. He came out with China for a promo. He was on crutches in a, in a knee brace and in a knee brace. And he said he would not be able to defend his coveted European title tonight. I love that DX had to win this belt, and then ever since they've won it, whoever had it, they bury it every time they talk about it. Well, you know what's funny about this is <laughs> when he said the coveted European title, I thought, wouldn't it have been so awesome? If Uncle Paul of NXT fame had come out two weeks ago at that press conference and announced that they were going to be doing a tournament in January on the 14th and 15th on the WWE Network and the winner would be crowned the coveted European title, <laughs> the European champion. Awesome. That would have been awesome. Instead, it's a UK title, which yeah. is weird because I remember in the 90s, I used to call it the UK title just because it was easier to type. And then, of course, everybody got on me because, Brian, the U.K. title, uh, European and U.K., they're different. Blah, 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 blah. So it's sort of like, okay, fine. I, I type U.K. because it's easier than typing out European every single time. But I understand I'm a stupid American. But anyway, here we are in 2016, and they're trying to get people from all over the place. And they're calling it the U.K. title. Why not the European title? Now it's like completely backwards. Anyway. So Hunter says he had dislocated his kneecap in a match the night before. So with that out of the way, he moves on to The Undertaker. Let's The Undertaker know that Shawn Michaels is not there. He is at home and sick. At this point, Taker's music hits. Druids wheel a casket down to the ring. This takes a while. Hunter is notably not intimidated. Finally, he says, I'm hurt. I can't fight. There's only one thing left to do. Break it down. And the casket opens. And out pops Shawn Michaels, and DX's music is playing, and they spray paint a graffiti all over the casket. And Shawn gets in the ring for a promo. And the first thing he says is, "The WWF wanted me to come out here with two skanks, but my real girlfriend's in Venice Beach, or something along those lines." And he says, "I have two new members of DX to introduce," and he introduces China's new breast implants. <laughs> this is all so amazing. It was. It was amazing for a thousand reasons. First off, Sean is talking about his new girlfriend. And he's like, I was I, I, I refuse to do what they want me to do with other women because I've got a girlfriend. Yeah. But then he has no problem ogling all over China's new boobs for five minutes. He really did. That's he number every, one. Every possible joke and pun you can imagine. Yep. And number two China, is go ahead. This was this was more amazing to me. This is all this is all in hindsight. In 2016, they 
actively, they actively are anti fake boobs for a lot of girls. Back in 97, <laughs> the, it was like, it was like she'd won an Olympic medal. She was <laughs> so proud of her new boobs. They were so proud of her new boobs. They wanted the whole world to witness as much of her new boobs as they could on national television. Yeah. It was astounding. Yeah, and uh, every, every possible pun you can imagine, and she's just laughing off all the silliness. So finally, Sean runs down Undertaker for a while, and then Sergeant Slaughter comes out to yell at them. Sean got in a line about, he called him, quote, a horny old man who wanted to check out China's new breast. He also called him fat. Sarge says, Hunter, if you cannot defend your title against Owen Hart tonight, then Sean, you will defend yours. This did not make Sean happy. You know what's amazing was you've got the NWO on one channel and you've got DX on the other channel. And I like Scott Hall, and Scott Hall really did sell for guys way more than Kevin Nash did. But God, Kevin Nash comes out, or Scott Hall comes out, and he does his survey. And it's like, it is such a babyface promo. Like, he puts over the town before doing the survey. Like, they're not even pretending that Scott Hall's not even, even, even remotely pretending that he's supposed to be like a real bad guy. He's a cool heel. Meanwhile, Shawn Michaels, Shawn Michaels is doing what the NWO should have done, but they didn't do. He goes out there every week and he tries to start riots. He tries to be Maybe, yeah. the most annoying. He comes out there and he wants you in the crowd to want to get in the ring and beat his ass. It's so completely different from what the NWO was doing. And the funny thing was, Sean was a guy that everybody actually thought was really cool because he was good at his job. I guess yes. they thought the NWO was cool too, but it's just amazing to watch. It's the same gimmick on both shows, but one guy's doing it right. And the other team's just out there laughing around and screwing the company. So DX was upset by this, but Sarge laid down the law. There was a large wooden box sitting over on the side of the stage. They kept cutting to it throughout the show. What a payoff that was. Oh, we'll get to that. There was a bunch of B-teamers backstage conspiring to take out Kane. You had Ken Shamrock versus Kama. In a battle of the real UFC guy versus the fake UFC guy. So they're doing this match, and it's time for Shamrock to make his comeback, and he, he runs the ropes and, like, ducks a kick or something, and he comes back off the ropes, and he just waffles Kama in the head with a clothesline. He drilled him. I was actually surprised Kama got up. Nothing else of note. Nation interference backfired. Shamrock won with the Fujiwara armbar into the ankle lock. Then D'Lo and Farouk were about to hit the ring when Rock appeared and called them off. Rock then cut a promo on social security. <laughs> this thing right here. First off, going back to the match, Ken Shamrock is now totally just another guy. Like, yep. they started it a while ago, but in this match, he's just a WWF wrestler. And not a very good one. No. Like, when he first came in, he was really good. Now he's painfully average. It's like they brought him from New Japan and sent him to NXT. Had to teach him how to work. And then The Rock. This is now the second week in a row that Rock has come out and he's begun a promo about some current event. It's fucking horrible. But <laughs> he's good enough that he's kind of, sort of making it okay now, not enough that they keep doing it, because this clearly ends sometime soon, because I don't remember them doing this, so it had to be short-lived. But all I got to say is, thank God they didn't try this a year later when he was really good, because he actually would have gotten it over, and that would have become his gimmick for the rest of his career. That's true. So, Rock announces Shamrock versus Farouk for next week, which is an unpleasant surprise for Farouk. Oh, yeah. And he says, comma, D'Lo, know your role. Yeah, and they did. They did. The <laughs> Rock, made. Was, Rock was already so good, and he's getting better every week. Yeah. It's, it's, sound, I mean, it's obvious, but yes, Rock was great. But he wasn't always. Dude, it was like four months ago that he was doing commentary and was the most boring guy ever. Remember that? 
Uh, yes. And his, his wrestling still sucks at this point. Just his promos are getting much better. Earlier today, <laughs> Vince, Vince McMahon cut a promo in an empty arena. He thanked all the fans for their success in 1997. He promised 1998 would be the most enjoyable year ever, and he may have been right. Wish the fans a happy new year. That was it. You know, there's a million there's a million reasons that the Montreal screw job was very obviously a shoot. Some people like to hold on to the idea that maybe it was some ingenious work by Vince McMahon. They talk about how Vince screwed bread and then he became the evil Mr. McMahon and, and look at where business went. The guy's a genius, blah, blah, blah. Look at, watch this promo. This guy is still trying so hard to be a babyface. This was the most babyface, babyface promo you've ever seen. I just want y'all to know that 1998 is going to be the most action-packed and enjoyable year ever in the WWF. You ain't seen nothing yet. Happy New Year. I was like, this guy is not. He won't quit. He's trying so hard to re to revive his own babyface career. Exactly. It was a rehabilitation segment for the Vince McMahon character. It was done pre taped not in the ring, just to ensure he would not get booed. And they were trying to... Make him a good guy again. <laughs> it's hilarious. It's it's two months after Montreal happened. It's like November 8th. It's like almost two full months after Montreal. He's still not giving up. No. He's his own Roman Reigns. <laughs> That's actually a great point. I still can't believe what I saw in this next segment. Oh, my God. As Vinny describes this, everybody, I want you to recall, number one, Think about what the Cruiserweight division is today in WWE. And number two, this was WWE's response to Eddie Guerrero and Rey Mysterio and Juventud Guerrera and all of the great luchadors and WCW's awesome Cruiserweight division. This is what they came up with. So it was Jerry Lawler and Brian Christopher against Takamichi Noku and a mystery partner. And we've seen Taka versus Christopher before and their matches are fun. We've seen Taka and Lawler, and they're a different kind of fun, but Lawler's an old, you know, great old school worker knows how to make it all work. So I'm trying to figure out who the hell the fourth wheel could be here. And out comes George the Animal Steel. Correct. The match began. George was such a horrible tag team partner, and he was eating turnbuckles as Taka got double teamed in the middle of the ring. As this was going on, by the way, a fan held up a sign using stick figures to indicate that Eric Bischoff was having sex with Bret Hart. Well, that's not very nice. This is like peak 1997 right here. So Taka has Christopher pinned with a moonsault, but George has taken the ref, costing his own partner a pin, and Lawler cuts Taka off with a foreign object. And then Lawler teases the moonsault, but George hits Christopher with a foreign object, and the payoff to all this to get their hot, young, cruiserweight superstar over is a four-way breaks out, and the ref calls for the bell. Yep. Because George the Animal Steel and Jerry the King Lawler and Brian Christopher, none of them could be pinned. No. They're all two biggest stars here in this cruiserweight division. In 1997. Yeah, this was an absolute waste of time. But you know what? George the Animal Steel was over, so I got to give it to the guy. I think if there's pro wrestling in hell, it may just be this segment on a loop. Or the Star King main event. And I'll get to that. This really was a, an amazingly bad rock. <laughs> oh. Hey, let's talk about the next segment. Let me do this segment. Yeah, how about it? You want to talk about fucking horrible segments? The Outlaws come out. They celebrate killing dude love a couple of weeks ago. Vicious chair shots, etc. Then we get this wacky video with Mick Foley cutting a promo in his various various personas. He's Dude Love. He's Cactus Jack. Foley comes down to the ring. He's got a barbed wire bat. Gets his ass kicked. Fights back. Mandible claw. A move more dangerous than a barbed wire bat. So, this leads to a match. Cactus Jack versus the New Age Outlaws. Two on one. 
This is what actually happened. Foley, who's coming off broken ribs, by the way, and by the way, needs a hip surgery for real here in 2016. He needs, needs a fake hip. Does his flying elbow off the apron, lands right on his ass. They're outside the ring. Road Dog grabs a chair. Road Dog winds up and fucking obliterates Mick Foley in the head with a chair shot. Just smashes this guy. What does this lead to, by the way? Well, it leads to Foley getting in the ring and doing more spots. Gets in the ring, doesn't sell the chair shot to the head that nearly killed him. Hits a double arm DDT. He goes for the cover. Billy Gunn breaks it up, and the ref calls for the disqualification. Jerry the King Lawler is fucking appalled. How in the world, he says, can you swing a chair at a guy's head on the outside of the ring, and that's not a DQ, but a guy's in the ring, and the other guy breaks up a pin, and that's a disqualification. Jim Ross also baffled. So, that was the match. It was fucking horrible for a thousand different reasons. Yep. Oh, and there's, there's more. more. There's more. So, Cactus Jack beckons, come brawl with me at the top of the stage. Yeah, well, I say, I say, okay. And they go up and brawl, and suddenly, from the wooden box, a chainsaw emerges, cutting its way free. Everyone stands back to watch as the guy inside with a chainsaw cuts a big hole in it. There is a pause as he puts down the actual real chainsaw, picks up the prop chainsaw, and fights his way out. And it's Chainsaw Charlie, which is just Terry Funk with pantyhose on his head. Yeah. He chases the outlaws down to the ring. The, uh, yeah, uh, the outlaws run down to the ring, then they run back to the ramp, and Charlie and uh, Cactus Jack chase them back. And all I can say is that Terry Funk is crazy, and crazy does not always equate to good television. You know, if I recall correctly, I am pretty sure that we asked Terry Funk what he was thinking and what he did to Chainsaw Charlie. And I, I am almost positive that his response was, I thought it would get over. Yeah, you know, he thought it would get over. And uh, like I say, crazy does not always mean good TV. Sable comes out for a promo. They're plugging the Raw magazine with her on the cover. She says, I'm going to give you a preview of what's inside when Mark Merrill comes out with a chair, sits in the middle of the ring, starts berating her, berating Kevin Kelly. He says, you're a third-string announcer, drops him with a low blow, starts yelling at Sable until Tom Brandy runs out to make the save. Now, before we talk Mer about Tom Brandy, i got to mention, mm -hmm. they're plugging the new Raw magazine, which is their version of the Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Edition. On the cover, it says, and I quote, there's a picture of Sable, all skimpy. And it says, in all caps, this is a real swimsuit issue. And for reasons unknown, the word real is in quotation marks. <laughs> I don't know. What does that mean? I don't know what that means. So, Mero beats up Brandy. It's a TK on a chair, leaves him lying, tears up the magazine, stuffs pages into his mouth and his trunks. Turns to beat up all the fans. And that was the end. Vinny, you're you're underselling the brilliance of this segment. I am, clearly, because I didn't think it was brilliant at all. All right, this is why it was awesome. So they really did have this swimsuit issue that was coming out the next day. Now, Sable sold a lot of magazines, made a lot of money for this company. And so what they did was they had her out there in a very, very skimpy bikini with a robe on. And she opened the robe just enough that a gigantic booby spilled out and then she covered it up again. It was a very, very small tease. And she never took her clothes off because they wanted to give you a, a taste, so to speak. And then the next day you had to go buy this raw magazine with the real swimsuit issue. And then on top of that... Mark Marrow tears up the magazine. He stuffs it down Tom Brandy's mouth and his trunks. And the key is, he didn't just threaten to beat up the people. He says, if I see any of you in the crowd with this magazine, I'm going to go beat your ass. This is brilliant marketing. Their idea was, all of these fans are going to go buy this magazine and they're going to bring it to the show and they're going to wave it to annoy Mark Marrow. 
So the guy gets heat and they sell a bunch of magazines. I thought it was amazing. All right, we'll call that the first good segment of the show then. Basically, well, Shawn Michaels' interview earlier. So the DOA, the headbangers, Flash, Funk, and Scott Taylor come out to call out Kane. Kane comes out. Before anything can happen, Taker's music hits. He comes out. Keep in mind, this is Kane and Undertaker's entrance, so it's like five minutes of TV time. Ross is screaming. Taker has had enough of Kane. He's going to be the eighth man to beat him up. That makes things very obvious. And sure enough, the Brothers of Destruction clear the ring. They have a stare down. Taker leaves. He says into the camera that he would burn in hell before he ever fights Kane, and the segment ends there. Michael Cole tries to interview the New Age Outlaws concerning their upcoming title defense against the Legion of Doom. They make an astute observation and a solid point when they say, who cares, there's a guy chasing us with a chainsaw. As they're screaming at him, the chainsaw cars at the door they're standing next to. They flee, realize they forgot the belts, run back, grab them, and then flee again. The door caves in. Jack falls down. Charlie carves up the door to prove it's a real chainsaw, and that's that. Yay. Jim Cornette delivered a statement on the state of pro wrestling. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I wonder I wonder what happened here. Because Jim Cornette does a promo that he's done a million times. He buries WCW. He buries the NWO. He buries ECW. And this time he buries WWF. He says, where's the wrestling at? He says, I want wrestling matches with wrestlers. Down south where I come from, we know wrestling. Wrestling fans watching a wrestling program want to see wrestlers wrestle, he says. It's not that hard. Says he's got respect for tradition. And if nobody else is going to bring wrestling to the WWF, maybe he's going to have to. Now, obviously, he's going back to being a manager. And he's bringing in, I think it was the Heavenly Bodies. I can't remember who he brought in. He brought in some NWA guys or something. Do you even remember? Who did he bring in? Heavenly Bodies, I think he ended up with Jarrett, too. Yeah, something like that. But anyway, I wonder if they just did this because he'd been ranting backstage during a creative meeting. Or I wonder if all the way back to his rants about Phil Mushnick, this was planned that far back. I doubt that possible but this company is not known for long-term planning that's true more so then than now now yeah there's a hell of a promo it was a great promo it was so great they go back and, and and keep in mind a key point of this promo was how he was a southerner who didn't like yankees so they go back to the crowd in long island new york and they approve of what he said so much they all give him an ovation <laughs> yeah and jerry Lawler says amen they've been sitting through a goddamn horrible show and all he wanted was some Southern style wrestling there in Brooklyn or wherever they were at. And this was followed, by the way, his promo about how there was not enough wrestling and there's too much bullshit was followed immediately by Sonny coming out and stripping. Uh, yeah, fans were okay with that, though. Yeah, they were. She came out in her uh, robe to plug the magazine and show her own bikini centerfold. So this is the opposite of the thing you described earlier. Well, they just showed you right away. Here is what is inside this magazine. Jim Ross announces the company is negotiating with Mike Tyson to appear at WrestleMania in Boston. Mike Tyson's name was mostly booed. Had an Owen Hart video package, and then Owen Hart versus Shawn Michaels in the main event. I do want to mention one thing. When they, for the entire show, were plugging, there was going to be a big announcement about Mike Tyson and WWF. And they finally make the announcement, and the announcement is, we're negotiating with Mike Tyson for WrestleMania. And Jerry Lawler, I guess they didn't fill him in, but Jerry Lawler's first words are, who's he going to fight? Yes. And Jim Ross is like, you know, I don't know if he's going to fight anybody. And it was like, I'll bet that's the first thought of every single fan, and they're all going to be disappointed. But hey, they got Mike Tyson. And it worked out in the long run. So it's Owen Hart's first match post-Montreal. His brother, the legend, was screwed in his last match and shamed out of the company. His brother-in-law was humiliated and sent packing. Other brother-in-law just, just disappeared. He's the only surviving member of the family. 
And here he is, his chance just to be the ultimate outsider and a, you know, just a, a complete new, complete reset for Owen Hart. He comes out, he's got the same crappy music, he's got a black singlet, because he has not slept or showered since Montreal. He's just a guy. So they're doing this match. Sean and Owen. I've seen a lot of Sean and Owen matches. I've seen a lot of great Sean and Owen matches. This was Sean and Owen going through the motions. Now, Sean and Owen are so great. They're going through the motions. They're blowing away everything you'll ever see in 2016 on Raw. But it was not their best work. I will say, if you are a wrestler or if you're training to be a wrestler, you should watch this match to see how to get the absolute most out of one sleeper hole. <laughs> I ain't how to run the goddamn ropes. And that too, yeah. Finally, Owen made a really great comeback. He hooks the sharpshooter. Hunter hits him with the crutch for the DQ, or at least that is the idea. It takes him several tries to get it right. And then DX beats up Owen, and the show goes off the air, and that is the end. I thought this match was awesome. They had this great match, and there's a spot where Owen gives him a suplex on the metal ramp. I mention Dolph Ziggler all the time and all these stupid bumps he takes trying to be Shawn Michaels. Shawn took the goddamn easiest bump for a suplex on the ramp you've ever seen. And granted, a lot of this was Owen. Owen grabbed him. He lifted him up. He put him down perfectly. Shawn took a perfect bump on the ramp. Probably neither guy felt a damn thing. And it looked awesome. All these guys today bumping around, landing on their ass and their hip and their neck and their head, killing each other, thinking they're being Shawn Michaels. Shawn Michaels was not an idiot. Owen Hart was not an idiot. He did a couple of very carefully timed bumps. And granted, every now and then he would do something kind of stupid. But in general, it wasn't like he was doing stupid shit every night. They did virtually nothing in this match. It was all... Uh, you know what? See a lot of matches... And Braun Strowman, for example, is going to come in and he's going to do something. And what do they call it? They go, it's going to be smoke and mirrors. He's going to hit people with a Christmas tree. There's going to be 15 guys that all fall down when he roars. It's a smoke and mirrors match. But you want to know what a great Shawn Michaels match was with no gimmicks? It was a smoke and mirrors match. The way he moved, like he would run. and He, he would move a lot to make it look like more was happening than was actually happening. His bumps were, they were all done at the right time. So they they had more impact than just doing stupid shit. Why am I here explaining Shawn Michaels matches to all these fucking wrestlers? They should be able to see it with their own two eyes. But you never know that watching some of these matches nowadays. Shawn was so great. Owen was so great. This match was so great. It's by far the best thing I saw on Monday. On Monday Night Raw or Monday Night Raw or whatever we were watching this night. By far the best match on either show. And they didn't do a damn that, thing. That is true. And it's 